fun. Greetings, fellow Frybox killers. Tiki here. And Blue Dragon 5. And welcome to a deep dive into Captain James Logan's The Edible States of America. Now, Dragon, if I was uh, if I was a smarter man, you know, someone with uh, more of an eye for synergy, I think we should have probably titled this something like, you know, taking a bite out of Captain Logan's The Edible States of America or something like that. I don't know. I don't know why deep dive was the first thing. I think you were thinking like deep dish this. pizza or something. I had to. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. So how is everyone doing in the comments? Uh, welcome. Welcome to the channel. Uh, if this is your first time here, this is a geek culture, you know, podcast based channel, much like geek evolution. Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, hey, Geek Volution. The Cap himself is in the building, folks. The Cap himself is in the building. Give it up for the Captain. Jim's got to teach so, stuff. <laughs> so what we're going to do, folks, is we're going to go... Uh, this is going to be a conversation that's going to be led, hopefully, by the audience as much as we can, depending on how much of an audience we get here. But, of course, we've got talking points, too. So, you know, we'll, we'll make it work between us. And we're just going to go through, um, Dragon, I'm going to let you summarize the book really quickly. But first, I want to just kind of speak from the heart a little bit about uh, Captain Logan and creative writing, if you don't mind. All right, go ahead. Don't be amazing in the comments. I don't embarrass <laughs> him too much, but by all means. All right. So uh, believe it or not, folks, creative writing is actually how I found Geek Pollution to begin with. Because I was just kind of like surfing YouTube one day, I don't know, maybe in the early 2010s, you know, 2011, 2012, somewhere around that era. And I find the old series on creative writing that Cap and Vince did, like way back in the day. And I got to tell you, Dragon, that hooked me on the channel. And it also, it also really gave me a push into the realm of creative writing. And that's a push that I'm still doing today and pushing myself to write uh you know i haven't written a full-blown novel yet but i'm getting there i'm getting there and uh so yeah i just want to express my gratitude to cap for uh you know this book was definitely inspiring to me from a creative writing perspective and just those podcasts back in the day with vince uh definitely also inspiring so yeah just uh captain logan's always been something of a uh you know of an every man's literary hero if you will strike in for me personally <laughs> yeah I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Geek he's kind of like he's kind of like an icon of like you know like the uh the little guy can be the successful writer you know the little guy knows what to uh you know knows what how about creative writing more than the big publishers sometimes anyways go ahead Certainly, sir. I mean, yeah, I, I too, you know, huge lifelong uh, fan yeah. of Geek Pollution ever since the, I remember what brought me to Captain Logan was the, it was the Batman film panels, which unfortunately no longer exists, which makes me a little sad mm. like that mm. recently. <laughs> but uh, no, sir, uh, it's, uh, that was kind of the foray, which kind of led me to Superhero Rewind and vice versa, and the rest is history. So maybe not there from the very beginning, but there pretty much, I think we're in kind of the same ballpark here. And of course, you know, regularly kind of frequent the live show, see what kind of the goings are for, for Geek Evolution. I see a lot of my kind of live show compatriots in the comments, such as uh, Bag Studios, uh, T-Edge One, and uh, some, uh, some new faces, too, I'm not super familiar with, like uh, uh, Apost Apostolic Nerd. I'm saying that remotely Apostolic correct. Apostolic Nerd. That's, Apost um, yeah, that sounds right. <laughs> Apostolic Nerd, welcome. Oh, yeah. Hey, I'm, I'm glad he's admiring my Fievel poster. Yeah, that is uh, one of my prized possessions. <laughs> Um, anyways, Dragon, uh, why don't we, uh, why don't we sum up the book? Because yes, we could go on all day about it. Like, we oh, we could be Geek Volution's <laughs> fantastic. You know, I, 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 more people not know about this thing. Maybe right, we, yeah, right. we could do that. But, uh, this isn't the time for that. But right now we got like, let's, let's give our overall thoughts on the book before we summarize. Because ideally, just to preface it all this folks, there are going to be massive spoilers about this book in case you, for some reason, haven't. Haven't haven't uh, had the chance to read and or and or see it yet. Uh, basically, of course, folks, it's available through uh, the Geek Flute. Just to highlight this, because it's probably important. I'm sure uh, Cap would appreciate this, uh, folks. Uh, you, the, the main way to access this book, you have uh, you know the the Geek Flute of uh, Patreon, which kind of if you, you become part of, they believe the uh, what is it, the superhero uh, Silver Screen Society, kind of the uh, kind of new fancy term we're calling it these days. Uh, really awesome. 
basically that'll kind of get you to the book. But uh, Captain Logan, in light of the situation we're all kind of currently facing, was generous enough to kind of give us a taste of what. No, sorry, a lot of puns and they're probably going to incidentally and on purpose you know, be throughout this whole thing. Gave us a taste of what the book would be like in audio form, which is which is quite what quite grand. Kind of, I love kind of like doing things set the podcast and audio books. So I think that's uh, that, that was great. I mean, the last audio book I really kind of uh, kind of like did stuff to and just kind of like listened to all the way through is uh, Kevin Smith's book. It's really good. So. Uh, anyway, okay, so folks, uh, gonna be a lot of spoilers here, but uh, yeah, let's let's give our thesis for the book. Like, how do we start off a book discussion before we kind of chime in with everybody wants us to get to desperately? Let's 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 share how we felt about the book. Tiki, how did you feel about this book? Edible states of America. Well, Dragon, please, I uh, give a summary, my friend. Give a summary. Okay. Well, folks, essentially, uh, as we kind of the <laughs> prologue of things. Uh, this is sort of a um, well. The shorthand is it's, a, it's the body horror take on "Let's all go to." Hold the on, I, I I I can just I can just sum it up with what Bag Studios says. Dragon essentially, Bag Studios says spoilers. People turn into food. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Dragon. I didn't mean to put you on the spot there. Yeah. Uh, so, Edible States of America. What I found the most impressive about this this book is how it cross-weaved all these stories, and yet it didn't feel like a collection of short stories. Like, there's a very fine line you can go there with that sort of thing. And I was really impressed by the running narrative throughout everything, in spite of the fact that, you know, outside of the Frybox killer and a couple other characters, really none of the characters intersect all that much, with a couple of exceptions. But Dragon, it's the world. It's the pol it's the socio-political elements of this world that really come together along with the body horror and then also kind of like the ridiculous sort of like let's all go to the lobby of it all, as you like to call it, you know. Uh it just all mends together into sort of like a, a great sci-fi souffle, if you will. It's uh and of course, folks, one of the big things that drew me to this book and really drew me in is I, I gotta tell you, it's crazy because, uh, you know, Captain Logan wrote it before all this, you know, Voldemort pandemic stuff started happening. I call it Voldemort, folks. Um, that's just my short term for it. But, uh, you know, before the pandemic stuff even started becoming a reality, this book was already pretty much in the can, conceptualized, written, and drafting process. Um, and so, man... It's just, it's really crazy to uh, to look at this as kind of like, it's, Dragon, I, I don't use the word prophetic. I don't want to use the word prophetic, but I struggle to come up with another word for it, though. Well, I mean, prophetic, it's I mean... It's very eerie. It's very eerie. Oh, that in is. In a way. How it mirrors, you know, what we're going through right now in kind of a weird sort of sci-fi anthropomorphic cartoon sort of way. <laughs> A more in, kind of a more entertaining version of said pandemic, I, I must say. It's, it's definitely has a little bit more like a you know, dramatic substance to it. Like in a million years, you never thought turned into food. Okay, I really what I expected. <laughs> right, so I guess uh, so, right. okay, here's, here's kind of my my summation of things here for my thoughts on it. So I, you know, of course, as I said, you know, body horror take on let's all go to the lobby. It's um, it's that, and it's it's a very unique and striking piece of fiction, man. It really is. I remember, I mean, when I got this, I, I sent a copy of it to my old uh, my old uh, writing professor, myself, my old fiction writing professor, and I, I assume he got a kick out of it. Um, so bear in mind, I heard from like the next day saying, "Oh, I, I actually sent this. a copy from uh, I, I sent a copy to my bookstore manager actually." Hmm. I don't, I don't, he got back and he said, oh, yeah, thanks for this. And, you know, kind of, we got a chat. And I don't imagine he uh, he read the whole thing within the one day. But then again, you never know. Sure. So <laughs> a point being, this is a striking piece of fiction, folks. Uh, coincidentally, tailor-made for our troubled times uh, at play today. Uh, you know, aimed – I'm really – I'm amazed that that, that, that Cat pulled it off. I really am. You know, he took a crazy premise because he's been talking this thing up for a while now. So the second novel he's, he's gotten to, after the girl with this – I believe the girl with the seven – Girl with the seven names, uh, which you know I, I hear good things about. So the girl basically, with the seven birth names, I think. I think it's the set. I don't know if it's first names or last names. We're trying to sidestep there, but yes, the girl with the seven Something names. Like I'm going that. to say first names. <laughs> just go with it. All yeah. right. So, 
Point being, uh, Girl Seven Lessons is probably Hollyhock from Bojack Horseman. But anyway, that's uh, <laughs> oh god. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, circling back nice. on point to my thoughts here. So this, I'm amazed they pulled this off. He took this crazy premise of you know people turned into junk food, and you know instead of I was just going into it expecting kind of an absurdist romp, which you know Cap's really good at, you know kind of his love of, Ed, of Ben Edlin and everything. Again, I was expecting I wasn't expecting full on comedy. I was expecting like, a lot of comedy, and uh, what oh. he did so be beautifully is he infused it with such humanity. The humanity is what really touched me about this story. That's what I was really gobsmacked by as I was reading it. You know, he really leaned, he, he, we, he infused the story with such humanity, he leaned into the idea and asked the right questions in fleshing out a fleshless world, as it were. And it's like, you know, you will believe junk food can make you feel things besides hunger. If you had to put that on the poster, there you go. You will believe junk food can make you feel things besides <laughs> hunger. You know, it's... Uh, <laughs> It's uh, it, it 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 it's quite uh, it's quite interesting, and it was a very very enthralling uh, read or listen, depending on you know how eventually people are gonna you know when they sample this, because eventually it'll be you know be you know, people will just be able to read it. But again, if they're in for kind of the, the theater of the mind, like I think we all are. Audio. Yeah, and I gotta say, like the mixed media of it all, you know, like having a different, you know, like tweets and podcasts and interviews and police logs and all kinds of in-betweens. That I love that about this book, and it really is. It really does make me want to uh, write something in that sort of style because, like I said, I feel like a uh, what I it actually I did kind of write something in that style. I wrote a little bit of a short novella kind of short story for a contest, a creative writing contest. And I did kind of pick up and use that sort of, uh, you know, I had like a newspaper article and a radio interview and, you know, stuff like that. And I, I just kind of did it as a challenge to myself. And one of the unique things about it is that it kind of forces you into a specific kind of language for each of the different chapters. And so each chapter you write, you kind of have to adapt the language and adapt the uh, persona that you're speaking for and adapt to the actual format of what you're writing. So... Yeah, that's one of the really striking things I found about this book is just how uh, I felt like the different the different uh, the different formats really helped keep pace with it. All right. Um, so uh, Geek Volution says World War Z was a huge inspiration. I reread it as part of the research. Now, I've never actually read World War Z. I've seen the Brad Pitt movie, but I assume it's very very different. <laughs> Also, it is the the girl with the seven first names, folks. Check it out now. Seriously, do that. Well, I was closer. Right. I was closer, but you, you were at it. Hey, you 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 named it. You actually named it. I, I no, no, no. I up. said I just just to be Mister Semantics for a minute. Uh, he said the girl with seven first names, not the girl with the seven first names. All right, okay. We'll meet in the middle and already <laughs> semantics. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, so let's uh, so let's kind of get things a cook in here. So again, basically the uh, kind of the general kind of premise and kind of like where we start off things with the book here is kind of the overall kind of summary, as it were, is kind of summary events and what the cell of the book is. So, in terms of the story is you know we learn through uh, you know a prologue of tweets and reactions and a presidential address that April twenty six, which again, folks, by no by no sheer coincidence, uh, today <gasps> Vodification day. <laughs> oh God. April 26th, a green flash of light, pretty much a like green lightning, caused a oh, massive... Oh, what do you know? I'm a corn on the cob now. Huh. Not really. <laughs> Would that be junk food, though? If it's slathered in butter. Yeah, okay. Anyway. I don't know. <laughs> right. It's a giant... It's called the giant healthier side of the healthier side of the junk scale spectrum anyways maybe like one of the fancy you know yeah like a slay like the fancy like kind of red white and blue like slathered you know anyway we're drifting right yeah, yeah. Okay. wrong food focus back to the food of the book here so massive food wave hits uh, transforms everyone in the us of a into processed food aka proportionally sized junk food with cartoony arms and legs again very let's all go with the lobby uh with uh, basically the whole the course of the novel is you know the various reactions uh in a world uh just in utter chaos and basically we frame the events and basically all the chapters not quite called chapters they're called documents it's kind of like found footage but a literary equivalent to that you know it's like found entries mm -hmm. of accounts in the aftermath like letters interviews transcripts honestly the only the i assume world war z is like this I assume it's done up like that with the documents and stuff. I can only assume so. And then also, the only book that I've read that is very, that's kind of close to this format is honestly goes way back to uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. 
You know, speaking of the prologue, I've, I've, I've got some breaking news here, Tiki. Uh, again, because it is the you know the foodification day. A fun fact: Bag Studios is actually turned into a a, <laughs> a, a, a giant chicken strip. Son of a gun! It's turned to, it's turned <laughs> into a chicken strip, uh, proportionally bigger than the average chicken strip. Oh God! <laughs> All right. So I, I really love, so with, again, I love the whole document thing. I love that idea. And again, I love just kind of piecing together this. But what's even better, um, what's even better, especially going back through it, is I love the passage of time and how that fits into the narrative and frames kind of a nation trying to move on. And like we have, we have essentially almost three separate anniversaries within the book of, of the original kind of food wave. You know, like we had only a year of the food the year after the food wave, we have a restaurant opening, and then beyond that, you get like big, massive shifts in status quo. And roughly by the time of the third anniversary, we have kind of our big ending, almost roughly like almost like like a, like a, like a check in per act. Even though I think I would define the first one being a little after the the first anniversary being a little after the first act, but that's that's semantics. Let's let's not dwell on that. Point being, we go three, we go beyond three years throughout this narrative. And we kind of track it through through the kind of the uh, all the interpersonal logs and so on and so forth. And even if you want, if you have one of those semantical guys, like you know what, that's the prologue. Though any good story, you don't need the prologue. Well, fine, I'll play your little game. So let's talk about the the op other opening of the story, which also frames things very well. Is Equally as well, uh, President Deer and Water. The address from the president. I really love this man. This is this hit the book off and like the perfect note for me. I really I had like a really really fun kind of experience with this. Where I really like this president, and that, that makes it, given the events of the, of the story later. I mean, oh man, I really like this guy. Now <laughs> I didn't think this through. <laughs> oh. Where I mean, I don't know. Maybe that's just the effect of again, his cab cab just kind of. Really, the author is really well capturing. Just like, well, some people, I, I was like a lemming to this guy. Like, I, I really, I was sold in the background. The guy's a father. He, he was the next cop. He was a veteran. He was a governor. I mean, this guy, he really covered the bases. He had a really good kind of comforting speech, I thought initially. It's, it, it's just a straightforward waffle president, uh, you know, <laughs> with a really solid speech and a cool backstory. It's like, okay, I'm, I'm kind of sold. This guy has won my fictional vote here. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, and then just throughout the novel, it just kind of like any good political scandal, it just kind of underweaves before your eyes. Yeah, speaking of which, uh, again, we're going to be jumping a little over the place here, folks, depending on kind of the comments that we get and where you guys want to direct the conversation. Yeah, by all uh, means, the possibly, comments are going to possibly. guide this conversation in any and all direction, yeah. Yeah. Basically, we have like one in doubt kind of structure here, folks. We're going to go through the way you want us to talk about this. So, apostolistic uh, nerd. Um, so question, do you guys think the explanation given for the wave at the end is what really happened? Interesting question. Tiki, thoughts? I mean, I don't, I don't really see why it wouldn't be. I, I don't, I, I kind of took it at face value. I, I think maybe the bigger question is, uh, how much do we buy it from a, you know, from a sci-fi point of view? Is it, is it a satisfying explanation? And I, I thought it was. I, I would agree. I mean, I take it at face value, but I do love uh, a really great element of the book is that it is it is um, it is a little up to interpretation. In that, what really fascinates me is that because these these documents basically haven't come out until now, within you know you reading the book, essentially you know the, these like the idea that it could have been something else, the idea it could have been something like like a sci-fi was really just kind of overlooked, glossed over, so no one's ever going to believe this. We're not even going to share this. Or again, it's kind of implied in the book that uh, it was kind of hidden, perhaps by the government in some space. I believe like the Big Bear um, document later on, the whole thing with uh, Trevor Oates, the uh, you know the, the the cream pie oatmeal guy, <laughs> and uh, and essentially there it's kind of implied that you know they tried to get this out, but e either it's been kind of blocked or kind of defamed a little bit. And of course we we're not supposed to see the last letter to the present, which is where the whole full circle kind of set up with the story here. Is that the president speculates someone is trying to make a statement with all this, and of course, by the end, we confirm, at least in theory, you confirm that yes, yeah, someone is trying to make a statement with this. That's kind of I've, I've been of that mindset. But what I'm getting at is, I, I love the idea that because we never entertained the notion that it could have been something science, scientific, or it could have been something like an actual thing, because we're not that accepting the outside possibility. People are just kind of you know, going with their own belief system, which in many points here kind of realizing like it was it was a, it was a god thing. It was a religion. It's, it's God getting really creative with the plagues, and of course, with that 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 breeds you know certain fry box killers. So again, take it take for what you will, folks. 
Uh, T Edge, he says he's six hours in. So T Edge, just so you know, we are, uh, you know, we are going to be kind of jumping around to some spoilery stuff. Just you know, just so you're aware of that. Um. So yeah, now now I'm kind of uh, paranoid to talk spoilers here. Well, we Anyways. said spoilers at the start. He he knew the risk. He, That's he true. Knew the That's risk. true. All right, all right, all right. Fair enough. It's, it's Fair transformation enough. day. Anything can happen, folks. <laughs> <laughs> also, uh, uh, Cap here in the comments is that the president's speech was actually the fifth or sixth entry that uh, that he wrote, which is very interesting. You know, that's. Um, yeah, the fact they wouldn't. So I wonder if he he got the uh, cap. I guess maybe confirm this if you can. Like uh, when you're working on the when you're working on the story, was it that uh, you kind of loop back and say, you know, this actually be a perfect way to open the book, or was it sort of like just kind of mm-hmm. uh, like I wonder how many things got shifted around in the kind of the course of making said novel. I, I wonder. So basically, the whole the whole point, of like kind of our opening here, is we properly establish after kind of like this kind of the fun kind of text and tweets and kind of like a little flavor of what we're going to be kind of sitting down for with the the highs and the lows of the experience being turned into junk food. The president kind of the style, okay, big presidential address at the start of things here says, "Guys, you're not dreaming. This is real. You are junk food." So it's kind of it's 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 exposition with gravity. I was kind of read it as I get exposition is not a dirty word, kids, but it's you know it's exposition with gravity. We need to know okay, this is what's going on. These are the parameters. Like you're not expecting like giant like carrots to be walking around. It's junk food, you know. You're, you know that you know we're kind of setting the stage up front, really nice and pretty for uh, for the people who are going to endure the journey. Yeah, I mean, if anything, I thought the stuff towards the end was a bit more of an exposition dump. An exposition dump, like you said, with, with gravity to it, yeah. for sure. Um, I, I think probably I would say the wrap-up to the Fry Box Killer is where it got a little bit like, this is the point of the Fry Box Killer. L- little Box kind of killer. like the end of Psycho, you're saying. A little bit like the whole... Exactly, this is what happened yeah, yeah. <laughs> Right, right, right. Now the epilogue, you know, the actual explanation for the, you know, for the transformation. That's all. That's obviously exposition, but it's stuff we need. Yeah, again, that's I know the gravity. fry box killer. Let, let's. Do you want to transition to the fry box killer? Well, I mean, I was going to build to it unless people said otherwise. I was just going to wait for someone to say, "Get to the fry box already, man." All right. Well, if people don't want us to talk about that fry box, and we believe me, folks, we're just going to break down box. all the fry box stuff once once the call comes comes upon us, folks. So you just strap in, okay? <laughs> uh, right now, let me if you say the words. Jeez, you just keep quoting these. Here's the I was so baffled last time you name drop Better Call. It's like, oh, guys, just name dropping kind of a running game for Better Call. So, what do you know? <laughs> I don't know. Okay, you know what? Fry box isn't brought up. Perhaps we can talk about it now. Okay, boss, listen. There we I go. Think, I think the uh, fry box uh, thread you. was probably my favorite part of the book. Yes, let's let's just jump to the fry. What's up there? Literally on the that's poster. Saying, of the, man, of, I don't of, see why we have to book. I don't see why have to beat around it, man. <laughs> no, I'm just waiting for someone to say get to it already. Right. That's what I'm saying. I was really wanting to say it's a very exciting part of the book. It's probably the best part. One, debatably, some of the best parts of the book. Uh. So. Let me, let me start off with this. My favorite thing about the Fry Box Killer and the way he's worked into the book is I love that there is an entry of the Fry about the Fry Box Killer once per act, and it's never the same thing twice. Oh yeah. Think think about it. So we have we start in the in the first act, essentially we have the vict the victim's perspective. Then of course second act, the killer's perspective, and the third act, the kind of the law's perspective from the from you know the the, the pizza slice detective. And the Fry Box Killer is also one of the one of the characters that has a presence all throughout the novel. He's, you know, he, sure, he's got centric chapters to himself, but still, he's kind of like that looming boogeyman in the background. I thought that was the, uh, that was the real draw to him, was that kind of like boogeyman sort of urban legend quality. Yeah, I love, there's so much, sorry, folks, there's going to be a lot to decompress in the front box. <laughs> Just going <laughs> to figure out where, where to dig in first here. Um, I mean, yeah. I mean, think about it. I love that his fir- the first encounter with Fry Box is that you know it's 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 this terrifying encounter with someone in the food service industry. You know, with uh, kind of the taco, the you know, Chip Ballard of it all here, where he's um, it's an ingenious idea of the container. I mean, of all the for anyone to be your killer, you want the Fry Box. I think it's a very deliberate and really brilliant choice. Very simple thing, without the fries. Serial killer with kind of a kind of a compact pouch to put his uh, put his trophies that he gets from his victims. I mean, it makes sense. It makes perfect sense. <laughs> the grease stains, man. The grease stains. I, I mean, that's the that's the great thing about this book in general is just kind of how it can take, you know, take food and just kind of like 
essentially gorify it, for lack of a better word, you know, just like, oh god, just never have descriptions of piles of food been more gory and disturbing, and the food stains in the cart are just, in the cart are no exception, you know, just like, oh man, <laughs> It'd be like if a serial killer wore a shirt. I, I apologize if this is getting graphic here, but it'd be like if a serial killer wore a shirt with the blood of all the all his victims on it. <laughs> you know, it's essentially that kind of messed up. Yeah, yeah. It'd be a dry cleaning nightmare, too. Oh, God. <laughs> so, all right. So it's, it's of course, uh, you know, of course, we get a, we get a big. Uh, Here's the thing: we had an expo dump that makes all the sense in the world because it's a serial killer giving a very egotistically driven origin letter about talking about his beginnings and his first kill and everything, which again is typical for serial killers. So it makes perfect sense. We can okay, second, kind of the middle of all this, we learn all we need to know about the fry box killer. And I love. Here's my favorite thing: one of my favorite things in the book as a whole. I love, especially in the re, in the kind of going through it again. I I love how. Uh, Sorry, I love the staging. I love the the timing for certain events. Like I love that we learn about the fry box killer right after we have a remorseful cannibal, yeah, you know, Roger Tippings, the guy who you know who, who mm. turned to the, I believe the hot pocket who ate the three people, and he you know, is writing a genuine letter of apology. Next chapter, a very sadistic letter of non-apology. <laughs> like I'm not apologizing for myself and the cannibal. I eat people. It's what I do. Mm. So again, like I, I love to so have like the you speaking to the folklore element of it all here. It's just the religious superiority and the divine motive of a psycho looking for the logic and cannibalism in the new setting. Just really, really good stuff there. Yeah, yeah. Um, kind of that larger than life sort of quality to it. Uh, just you know, just I don't know, Dragon. I I, I was uh I actually grew up in a town where there was a really, really famous kidnapping in the 90s. Uh, I'll go ahead and name drop it as Polly Kloss. I'm sure anyone who was around in the 90s probably knows that name. Um, believe it or not, uh, my grandma actually lived on the same block as that girl when she got kidnapped. So suffice to say, Dragon, and this sort of like larger than life sort of urban legend mythology stuff, you know, it, it's, it's something that fascinates me because it's something that I've lived around my whole life because of just that air of sort of darkness that my hometown is shrouded in because of that incident. So I don't know. I just I, I really, really like the way it's described, the way it's broken down. Just really, really captivating stuff. Oh, Mad Men in the comments here made an excellent pull that I'm so glad he made because I was thinking the exact same thing when I was reading the book for the first time. I was thinking to back to the dark, to a quote from the Dark Knight. Uh, Mad Men says, I was thinking about the Dark Knight when I heard the, the Frybox killer story. When the chips are down, these civilized people will eat each other. I'm not a monster. Oh, I'm God. A well, yeah, they, they will literally eat each other. I know, that's what I'm saying. Like, of course, when you're saying when the chips are down, I think like less poker chips, more like you know, like bag of chips. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. There's so many food puns we can, we can put into this conversation. So that, many food puns. That there are. So let me tell you my take on the fry box killer as like was my kind of take on him after reading like his big origin stories. That this is a guy who takes his own disappointments in life and he projects it onto his victims. And he sees, you know, his crusade is kind of his grand divine crusade as doing him a service because no one, you know, no one else can real, you know, because no one else is willing to do it and no one else can realize their dream. So his purpose is, is, you know, they need to be eaten by the one man willing to do it where no one else is like going to, is, is going to eat them. Mm -hmm. You know, so again, it's like kind of the, it's kind of the victim who is not. Well, according to him, he was psychologically and verbally abused by his father. Again, it's kind of again it's unreliable narrative. I'm not sure how much of that is is, is genuine, but then again, it's the questionably questionably tragic backstory, tragic backstory with an with an asterisk. Because what we learn about him is that he's a 450 pound man, which again semantically, I have clay. How is he going to break into that kid's house if he's 450 pounds and be stealth stealthy about it? But again, that's that's neither here nor there. My point is, so I, I just read that as the ego speaking, not necessarily that he'd be able to actually accomplish it. Sure, sure. And again, that's a very that's a valid point as well. And again, I, I wonder if he was exaggerating the weight. But then again, given I, I don't know, yeah. it, it, again, given the, the the imposing size of the fry box, it's hard to tell. The point is, you know, I love that you know we just he, this four hundred fifty pound man is turned to this large, imposing kind of a uh, you know representation of gluttony, uh, and he's portable, as we learn later. Man, man can mail himself anywhere, which is horrifying. <laughs> 
<laughs> and we learned that you know his father's job, and essentially, we're getting kind of the maybe the origin points of, of the fry box even further here is that you know the, his father hated his job, therefore it's kind of this builds this question in the killer's mind. You know, why bother trying to succeed in life if, if this is kind of what I'm aspiring to do? You go out there, try my best, and eventually hate what I'm going to do the minute you achieve something you detest it. So really, yeah. So again, it's kind of like kind of yeah. cements what is what he's doing in life. Or again, I mean, I'm just, what if I can just he finally gets a thought that makes him feel something and makes him feel like he has a purpose. And again, he kind of construes this as God, because again, there is no like direct explanation that we're entertaining for this random food wave. You know, it's that God thought of everything, this mentality, you know, God thought of everything. There's no evidence clean if I eat them. And uh, it's just, I can store the, store the leftovers and just kind of like toddle on my merry little way. <laughs> you know, it's, you know it's like the lack of answers inspires, you know, speculation in this case, fry box is an agent of God, which is, which is frankly terrible. Fine. You know, the cardboard ben handle studios like make a good point uh he says i assume he that he would have failed had it not been for the food apocalypse and yeah he's uh he's just like a lot of other you know i can think of several walking dead villains that kind of fit into that realm of the governor especially where they were pretty much you know almost pathetic before the apocalypse and then the apocalypse kind of put them into a position where they could kind of craft their own narrative. And with the governor on The Walking Dead, it is very similar where, you know, he literally calls himself the governor. He gets himself this larger than life persona. All right. Anyway, Dragon, I'm sorry. I kind of cut you off. I was just, I, I wanted to get to that comic. It was, it was a pretty on point. Comic. No, no, no. That, that, that's a great one. That's it's a great one. So I love, yeah. I love that something else with the Fry Box Healer, especially on the reread, is that I love how we, in the earlier chapters of the book, we keep setting up everyone has these, these dreams or kind of these these things they do in life and they can't achieve it anymore because of the mm -hmm. food wave. And, you know, I like how this kind of this this feeds into the overall, again, like we're, we're, we're kind of setting up the monster as it were. Okay, these people have dreams that are unfulfilled. And of course, this, this whole character, as we kind of get to by the end of the Frybox Killer stories, as a guy who's all about... You know, he's, he's a personification of everyone's deepest fears, and he's kind of a personification of their deepest realities also, in a sense, you know? Yeah. Also, uh, right, uh, um, Apostolistic Nerd has some really interesting comments. He was asking, first of all, as a question for us, I think. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> generally to everybody involved, but I'm just going to answer on our behalf. So what I would turn into yeah, a dull whip. What turn into? Dull whip, dull whip, dull whip, dull whip. Um, anyone who's been okay. to the Disney park knows what I'm talking about. Pineapple sherbet. That's absolutely what I turn into. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, now Tiki, you, I know you've read the book. So you're telling me don't whip as in like you have to be in the special refrigerated <laughs> little, little Dragon, section. I'm not saying that would be ideal. <laughs> I'm just saying it based on the number of dole whips I've physically consumed. <laughs> well, yeah, you're right. Okay, well, giving an and honest also, answer. Dole whips are very close to my heart and very close to my personality as well. So, you know, <laughs> well, dole whips are directly connected to the tiki room, you know. <laughs> Well, looking okay when you've put it like that, I guess the uh, okay, I guess the honest uh, <laughs> for myself in terms of frequency, what I eat most, and maybe says something. Okay, I want to be clear. Okay, it's going to sound horrifying, but um, oh, <laughs> uh, McDonald's fry box. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, I know. It sounds in terms of frequency. In terms of frequency, yeah. it's probably like I, I feel like a lot of us would be lying if we said that that was. Anyways, that's what I'm saying. I mean, I, um, I, I, could, I could lie and come up with something else, but I mean, look, it's, 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 it's fry box. I mean, I, it, it, I have two choices here. I have the choice of either of either the serial killer or the or the one who gets set on fire. So I'm unfortunately kind of leaning towards the one who gets set on fire. From being honest, so. Uh -huh. right, speaking Logan, of Logan, really liking my uh, really liking my dull whip. <laughs> uh, Captain, I'll tell you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, Captain. <laughs> Jesus, I'm sorry. I, I I don't know if I should call him James or Captain Logan or what. I guess just Captain Logan. Um, Captain Logan, I'm going to tell you a little a little origin story of my name Tiki. All right. So back when I was 11 years old, I went to the Tiki room for the first time, and I was transfixed with it so much that I uh, I, I just wanted to learn everything about it. So I went onto a Disney fan board and I entered the name Number One Tiki Room Fan. And people on there just kind of, uh, I, I frequented that board so much, that name got shortened to Tiki, and here we are now. So Captain Logan, the Tiki Room, what I'm trying to say is the Tiki Room is very much a part of my actual identity. I've had that identity, 
I've had that screen name since I was 11, and I'm like 30 now. So literally going on two decades. Anyways, yeah, yeah love the tiki room. Basilistic Nerd also says, if Frybox is yes. a supervillain, what food would be would, would his nemesis be? Um, actually, I'm going to throw this out there. If there's a sequel, which again, we don't need a sequel to this, but if there were, <laughs> I'm going to say Roger Tippins, you know, the Hot Pocket. I, I think he would, uh, I think he should be. Oh, enemy. I like that. I like that. Ooh. Again, kind of the, the, the kind of the remorseful cannibal versus the non, you know, the non-apologetic cannibal. That's, that's okay, my pitch so... <laughs> So we can't we can't make an easy answer and just say like a healthy food, right? Because obviously in this Doesn't universe, exist. healthy foodified people don't exist. Um, ah, the tiki room was your son's favorite part of Disneyland. That that's awesome, Cap. That's awesome. I, I love that. I love that. I love that. Uh, younger generations are appreciating it as much as I appreciated it. Anyways, uh, and I'm sorry. Don't don't want to get sidetracked here. Oh boy, good question. Good question. <laughs> well, me and the gumball vigilantes. I'm sorry, not, I keep saying the gumball. I know they're not the gumball, the, the rock candy, because all the rock, glam rock and all that sort of stuff. The rock candy vigilantes. Those are my two. Those are my two. Pictures. You know, it would be hilarious if it was a Burger King Whopper. Huh? Just like you know, the McDonald's versus Burger. No, King no, no. Ball. I hear you. That's that's, <laughs> that, that, that's not. That's a good pitch. I like that. <laughs> Yeah, Cap, I, I still need to read the uh, Tiki Room comics. I've read the Haunted Mansion ones, but I haven't gotten around to the Tiki Room ones yet. I still need to get on that. Anyways. Let's see. Uh, so anyway, so Climax, speaking again, we're still in the, the, the Fry Box. It's about kind of the third act of the Fry Box story. So Detective John Slice, mm -hmm. uh, and of course the whole Barry, the, 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 what is it? Uh, is it Barney Wedge? I think Barney Wedge is the... Um, is the, is the victim the opponents though we have a fire and this this makes it even more painful when you realize that he's a firefighter it's the the other the other fry box who again is a McDonald's fry box therefore he has these mistaken for the you know the killer everybody's talking about kind of kind of the fast food Ted Bundy as it were mm -hmm. you know we're uh you know he's, he's um I love that you know he's you have like another crusading fry box um, essentially that he talked into you know, setting himself on fire versus uh, watching his family be devoured. And of course, either way, his family's dead. It's just the most tragic thing. I, I, of course, the one of the great things about the book is that as you go further and further, it gets darker and, and, and more, more damaging. <laughs> it just keeps going yes, on. Yes. Yes. It just keeps ramping up and up and up. And you think, Oh my God, how can it get more, more intense than this? Oh, the gingerbread man just happened. We'll get there. We'll While get we there. do border on full on kind of psycho <laughs> kind of uh, exposition uh, with the with the end of the fry box. Or I think the ears. I think it's less exposition. I think it's more a factor. If Cat wanted to wrap it up, the author wanted to wrap it up more, all in one chapter and one uh -huh. document. I feel there are two chapters. I feel go on a little bit long. And like for example, uh, the, the seven. I believe it was like the seventh chapter of the school teacher. With the but we have the testimonies from the kids where we get the big Tom Pop story, which we'll talk about. Maybe a little bit uh, in a few minutes, perhaps. But the whole Tom Pop story, uh, we have testimonies from the kids, and I feel like that's kind of two chapters. You have the school teacher and, and the kids. It's more about the kids, but I, I, I get what you're yeah. trying to do. It kind of breaks the structure there. Where again, it's like it's usually one testimonial per chapter, but again, he's getting a little ambitious with it. So again, I won't cast any any sin, stones of sin, but the um, but uh, with, with John Slice here, basically, we have like three three kind of stories within one chapter for the fry box and the big climax thing. Cause there's a lot to get through. And again, we don't want to take away from the kind of the ending of the story, which follows this and then the epilogue. And it's like, okay, so we have uh, we have the detective story of a track in the fry box. We have, uh, you know, we have the, the victim of the, uh, Sorry, we have that. We have again. We have the uh, the the other fry box kind of trying to stop, trying to stop our guy. And then we have the capture. That's roughly three stories in there. <laughs> but while it's while it is a little extraneous, it's like, again, you know, I do. Cap covered all of his bases with this roughly. You know, it's a like he's a, he, he, he figured out so much. Like the whole postage, how he sends himself postage wise, and all the every time he wrinkles himself is extremely painful, but he doesn't feel anything. Which is the, these are the eerie details, folks. And you know the whole identity theft. That's why he's kind of fixing on all the fry box in case he had to steal an identity. He's got the money. He's got the knives. That keeps them all behind the sticker. I don't know how that works, but it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> so just just that uh, just tremendous many points on the fry box killer again as you say and again very appropriate if it was ever appropriate for any podcast we would ever do tiki chef's kiss man chef's kiss Mwah. Mwah. <laughs> yeah, just, uh, yeah all right um okay uh, madman's oh, asking God, did we talk uh, about the hungry eye story that's one that's one you want to really talk about right that's like that's a good one 
that was one of the ones that really got to me. Yeah, you know what's, you know what's cool about that story? Uh, initially, I was I was underwhelmed by that chapter. Initially, I was like, okay, we're, it's this really? pretzel girl talking about puberty. It's like, we already kind of went through this with the birds and the bees thing. That was a lot better. And I was like, okay, we're doing this again. But then again, like halfway through, thing like maybe like a quarter of the way through halfway through it gets interesting like, okay the father has returned and again we're kind of we're back and borders have, have reopened father's there and the father is a regular he's a reg and oh my yeah oh my no goodness, to it's... me it wasn't about i mean i, I don't know I, I thought we got like a slightly different perspective on the puberty thing than the other chapters so that was fine with me I mean, yeah i mean it was I, fine but, like but it was said... just like compared to the momentum that's the thing i love the momentum we build in the third act of things like after that basically when the border is open i kind of define it as a third act when the border is open we keep ramping sure, things sure. up and then we get uh, and we get that it was like eh, i don't know it's like we're kind of it sounds like we're kind of stepping back the, all the way back to act one but then things get interesting rather quickly <laughs> Yeah, oh, man, um, just, I don't know, just, I, I, I love the way that that chapter just ends on such a, such an ambiguous, tragic note, I mean, it, it very much, Dragon, I'm someone who, uh, I don't know who, I, I don't know anyone, if anyone in the comments here listens to uh, true Reddit stories, like true horror stories on Reddit, like, let's not meet and stuff like that, and uh, that's very much what this chapter reminded me of, it reminded me of something that's, I, this is going to sound super silly, right? Because it's literally the idea of like, you know, a man who wants to eat his daughter who's been turned into a pretzel. But it's a realistic scenario, Dragon. <laughs> like it's a, it's as realistic as it can possibly be for the for the goofball situation that we find ourselves in. You know, it's just it's written in such a way where you you can really feel the fear. The fear is so palatable. I mean, the parallels to kind of a domestic abuse si situation here, where it's basically just you know, as if like, it's kind of right before something bad happens. You know, something bad's going to happen. You you're mm -hmm. not going to have a wall on your side until you have concrete proof. And again, if she goes to the police saying. I think my dad's going to eat me. That's not going to go well because you have no proof. And again, she tries baiting him online with the, the, the forums are terrifying. Kind of the message board kind of forum thing is, is, is kind Oh of my God. Yeah. Thing. That was almost more unnerving than the actual ending was just the idea of the forums and that there's a whole subset of people. Oh God. Ooh. And the unsettling, and of course, the unsettling disappearance of both the mother and the daughter and the question, yeah, of, well, he never yeah. responded, but then again, could he have been clever enough to see what was happening there and he kind of cut, decided to cut his losses? That's the real question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that was a definite highlight of mine for sure. Let's see. Uh, okay, so Bag Studios. Uh, he wants to. We we kind of. I broached it briefly. The whole Tom pops of it all, like you know, the the school system of it. I'll talk about kind of about the school system here. It's the uh, the, um, the chat. I believe. Uh, yeah, let's see. It was uh, Candace Berry. Yes, Candace Berry and the kids. Yeah. Well, I mean, like you said, in Cap even acknowledges it himself that the uh, the letter to the parents maybe could have been a little bit more. Uh, you know, a little scaled down. Uh, but other than that, I, it was really interesting to see the uh, the kids' perspective to the whole thing, and I really thought the I really thought a fascinating idea with just how how mankind in general was reacting to the transformation was the idea of it being kind of like the second puberty, you know, and I, I, I and that it, so the idea that kids were less affected by it than adults who have been, you know, like living in their day-to-day -day bodies for decades would be, you know? So, uh, I don't know, that angle on it, that whole, uh, you know, the the two different perspectives, the innocent versus the, you know, the people who kind of have a more cynical outlook on things. Yeah, like the candy corn you, girl. I love the candy corn girl being all, being all like optimistic. I can point to people now, and it's hilarious. You look at everybody. Yeah, 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 right, right. And, and of course, we have, that's on, the, that's on kind of the humorous side of things. And of course, on the less humorous side of things, the Tom Pops sale, which is, which is, Again, kind of a really taste of how dark things are. It's like just literally the tip of the iceberg, man. It's this this haunting moral gray of the new status quo that we've now built. Like, where is the line? Like, when is the visage? What? Where is the line when the visage of humanity is gone? You know, like a bully. We we have bullies who are now turned sadists because, like, it's like it's like a kid shooting uh, shooting at a can with a BB gun. Which again, mom said it was okay. How is what water does that hold? When everyone's been turned into things, when, when kids have been turned into soda cans, when you hear that, it's like, oh god! And there's like a Stephen King novel. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, and and again, it's like perhaps uh, you know, 
it's like there's a I think there's a kind of a question. It's almost like a Lazarus pit question. Like, did was Jason Todd always bad, or like was there something in there? It's like perhaps people's natures are either accelerated with the food apocalypse or are put on displays, and they were always like this. And now they can just, they're a little bit more freed up. Like, was the tub of lard kid? Not a fat joke, folks. He literally was a tub of lard. Was the was was the tub of lard? You know, like was he just always this this rotten, or is he just kind of like an average kid working through stuff? Who then just like eh, he's, he's he's an admit object, and I'm I guess I'm somewhat superior to. Him. I just crunch his can again. Like the idea of like all the ramifications these kids don't get. Like in that same chapter, another thing that highlight with the can is Barry of it all. Uh, she had this really there's really haunting bit in it where she has to explain to kids what cannibalism is. That's that's kind of a sad mm. rule. You have to explain mm. like if you eat your friend, he's not going to come to school the next day. You know, like that sort of thing. Like this isn't a dream. There's no like it's not a video game where you're like a second life, kids. It's not like every day you take what you will and then you're gonna wake up the next morning perfectly fine. That that's 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 quite haunting. Mm -hmm. All right. Um let's see. Let's see. All right. Well, uh, let's uh, let's talk a little pros and cons. All right. Um, okay. So uh, you yeah, know, let me tell you. So I think Cap. He has, uh, of course, what we love about uh, the author. He's a very, he had a very analytical style. He's got a very analytical signature that uh, you know, you love from. Uh, I think get really gets to shine here in the construction of the story. You know, it's like a, you know, it's like for example, some characters I think really benefit from this, like the food critic, the kind of the the kind of hypocritical food critic, Matt Cain. You know, he turns to the fried apple pie. It works perfectly. We have an author mm -hmm. who, as you who works here, we have an author who works in his experiences as both as as a critic, as a writer, through kind of like the Ron Naff of it all, uh, mortician, which Cap again. I keep telling him, Cap should write. It. But yeah, but then again, I was reading when I was listening to the book. Oh, Cap did work a little bit of the old mortician experience in there. What well, you? No, or at least like kind of a little nod. To it, where, <laughs> where it's like, I keep telling me, like, Cap has some great mortician stories. Apparently, he can't fully recall. I mean, if he's looking for a subject for for a book in the future, man, the mortician tales sound fascinating. But of course, uh, so the you know the Don Bacon affair of it all with the mortician stuff, and of course, Cap's experience, you know, the author's experience as as a, as a parent, the you know, kind of a fan of superheroes with the, the rock candy vigilantes. There's a lot mm -hmm. in there. A lot, a lot. Of, it's, it's very. You can see like the author really put his heart and soul into the piece, and I think it really shows well. And again, Frybox Killer alone need I say more. However, here's the double-edged sword of it all. So the con of it all is kind of a pro as well. Is that where and I think I've heard this from a couple people, so I know I'm not crazy on this. Is that I feel. Sometimes uh, the analytical style that aids in the narrative and the story doesn't always gel with the humanity I really love in the book. It doesn't always gel with the kind of humanity that we've cultivated in in, in certain characters and certain entries. Like uh, the biggest, the, the main example I have, always, the example that always bugged me is uh, between uh, Ron Naff and uh, L Lacey the Wedding Cake. The Wedding Cake always bothered me because there's a scene where he's basically, I, I believe, recounting the conversation with Lacey about the breakup, and the problem is. Lacey's dialogue in that scene is like that's that's an analysis of a breakup. That's not someone breaking up with somebody they care about. That that's kind of a problem, you know. Yeah, and you know what that that is actually uh, one of the things that I feel like it, it, it's certainly a challenge when you're writing a book like this, where it's you know it's less first person or third person yeah. perspective and more you know just the documents, right? Like because like I said, even writing those seven chapters that I wrote for my little short story, I, I definitely ran into the problem perspective myself. But you know, for sure, it's you know, there are there are times, there are moments within the book where I'm like, okay, this feels more like uh, you know, the author's voice is coming through maybe a little bit too much, you know, maybe a little bit too, you know, like uh Oh, God, I don't know. I wish I could think of a specific example. Of well, I have another example. Uh, well, okay, Go so, ahead. so the main one I have is, is Lace of the Wedding Cake. But beyond that, there are a few there are a few examples of uh, the track star. I believe the ice cream bar track star, uh, where she um, it felt. I feel like we kind of went, I think he goes on a little bit long in certain chapters where, again, we're kind of starting from the place of conversation, or maybe a better example. Let me give you a better one. Okay, so the. Uh, we talk about the Hollywood system. We talk about the, the Hollywood system. I believe that uh, was like chapter 15, uh, Tilda Hershey, the Hershey lady. She's talking about how the uh -huh. movies are made. I love that. But the problem is that's not an interview, the way that's structured. That's uh, we're, we're, having, we're sitting down for an interview and it's really like, she's going on for a really long time. Like, I'm the king of run-on sentences. So again, I, I will not, I'm not throwing yeah, stones yeah, yeah. looking at it. Is that 
it's just the fact that it just it goes on from when you're there's no back and forth between the interview, and I feel it's kind of Cap just wanting to write his book versus versus again sticking with the format and the conversation. Again, in some elements, I think he cat I think he kind of hinges his bets in the proper way. Like look at chapter 21, look at the uh the big the big kind of sci-fi exploration of what may be the cause. At the start of that chapter, I believe it's uh it's a writer, it's uh again, it's Oates, Trevor Oates, uh, the guy who's like doing the piece on about Big Bear. The, you know the uh, the inform I believe called Big Bear, and essentially he says at the start that I'm gonna I'm gonna jump around here, so it may not be it might be a little, little hard to follow. So he kind of he said I'm not used to writing in this sort of person, and so on and so forth, and he he covered all of his bases right there, so like I had no problem with it, you know. And it's like, obviously you can't do that for every chapter, and it is difficult. And again, go, doing 31 really well written chapters are gonna like sequentially kind of fit in with each other. It's it's a tall order, folks. So again, it's you know it's understandable. Sure, sure. Well, here's a minor quibble. This is not directed at Cap. I believe it's directed at DJ Martinez the <laughs> Third. If if I believe, I believe he created the uh, the image, you know, kind of the poster for the book. And of course, what's a huge detail from the book, Tiki? <laughs> the fry box killer. And and basically, with that, everyone transformed. They have uh, they have how many fingers? Oh right, it's four. Yeah, I didn't. I'm sure that was just the communication between the author. I didn't and pick the... up on that at all until you pointed it out. So it's not very noticeable, at least. I mean, it's again, okay, it's a really cool image. So who am I to you know? Again, it's obviously it's not to be taken super literally because you know you couldn't fit all these Jimmy-sized food items inside the little you know, inside the fry box. Well, yeah, exactly, scale, exactly. So. <laughs> but I'm just saying the finger <laughs> thing. Given we constantly say you know four instead of five, we make a point of saying it. I don't know, it, 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 it. I'm saying I think what happened is DJ said, "Hey Cap, you want to use this?" And it's like, "Oh man, this looks awesome. Yeah, I'm going to use this." And before oh, maybe totally, before DJ, totally. I don't even know if DJ read the book or he was given like a few pages that maybe did not mention the finger. It, it, it's irrelevant. It's a small quibble, is all I'm saying. But it's no. Or even just he, he was just given a basic summary, even maybe, or like even just yeah. like was asked to dry like the fry box killer, you know, <laughs> it, 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 before it, the exactly. four finger thing. <laughs> so my point of it, unless you got anything else, I mean, I have like a taste thing where I wasn't crazy about the game show host document, but again, again that's kind of kept putting a few of the things that he really he's really into in there where maybe it didn't belong. Where I don't, I don't the game show host really translate as well as it did, where he's not really on a game show, he's doing an interview while being a, you know, Milton Eggman. That that that, that chapter. It's like, I, um, yeah, I, I feel like sometimes with the mixed media of it all. It does get a little bit. It does get a little bit crowded. Let's say of like you know, like you said, it's like the game show host who's on a talk show giving an interview and he's telling a story, and so there's like three different kind of narratives going on all at once. There, you know what I mean? Oh, okay. Here's something. Um, I, I I hear your yeah. point there, Tiki. I'm sorry. So I'm no cap saying two things here. So, uh, no, it's good. Cap says DJ did read the book. Uh, we both couldn't believe. That. I did that, and neither of us missed it. It happens, Cap. Again, we're not throwing any stones there, friend, though. We're not. So, uh, Cap also... He asked I'm petitioning for a special edition cover. <laughs> yeah. Hashtag release the four finger cut. Oh, God. <laughs> trim the finger. Trim the finger. <laughs> anyway, and of course, the original give the finger to that very... Okay, anyway, so it's... Okay, oh, being Cap says... Um, out of curiosity, did you guys figure out what kind of food Big Bear is? Tiki, I had no, I have no clue. Did you have any idea what food Big Bear was? I assumed some sort of candy was my guess. Yeah, yeah. You know, like kind of like how 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 you know, like a chocolate bunny rabbit or something. I hear you. I or like a think gummy it's... bear. Yeah, I, that's the thing. I never really gave it too. I thought it was something. Well, this is not this is not a good descriptive term. All something kind of like gooey or melty, if it were. I don't know. I don't know why. <laughs> I just I just went to it because again, I, I don't know if I was thinking candy. I was thinking something. I I, you know. Oh, you know what? You know what it might be? I, oh uh, God, I feel stupid. You know what it might be? Gummy bear, giant gummy bear. Well, that's that's what I just said. Yeah, oh, you, <laughs> that's pretty much what my mind. Well, you said to. candy, and I just figured, okay, well, I'm sorry. I, I basically I spelled out what you. I said, I, I elaborate. I was like candy or chocolate, you know, chocolate Easter bunny. Yeah, chocolate bear. bunny anyway. is not a gummy bear, but I point being, I think you 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 hit it on the head. Though. I think it's All right, and yes, that, yeah, that yeah, you said gummy bear. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, there you go. That's just uh, folks. It's just kind of the kind of elaborate stupidity in the moment there, where I just I, I didn't think about it until big bear, <laughs> gummy bear. What do you know? Gummy bears hiding here and there and everywhere. They're the gummy bears. Is that the actual jingle? 
Y- yes, yes, it is. <laughs> anyway, sorry. <laughs> okay. I don't know if that's like the words, like line for line, but yeah, that's the basic melody. <laughs> yeah, well, the point is, folks, you'll notice not a lot of cons. I think that speaks to the writing overall. A lot of good stuff in the book, and one of the, I think one of the best elements of the book, uh, perhaps the world building. Oh yeah! Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, like you said, just how the way that it builds, you know, just kind of like that, you know, just just how, and it's kind of crazy to think, Dragon, that we are sort of in our own little story as it will with this pandemic going on you know it's like we're literally part of history and that's what this book feels like when you're reading it it feels like you're reading you know and that's and the written history of the uh foodified states of america you know i I feel like he gets his subtitle across very well sorry that was a very long yeah because it goes very cross country we explore all the yeah yeah well, you know, I, I, it's definitely oh. the most fascinating. As one of the most fascinating aspects of the story, there, where you know, we, I, I love that we like. I'm just going to break down. I'm going to rapid fire a few, few really kind of like we, we explore so much. There's only so much time, folks. But I mean, let's see. For example, like you know, the education and caring. Like never a special education meant meant more. Where you know, we have kids who need to be put in freezers if they're ice cream. That I think that's the real crap. That's the crappiest food you could become. Because I mean, I mm-hmm. love, well, you know, I love, I love a good ice cream sandwich, but I would not want to become one. You know, because oh, of God, yeah. the chance of <laughs> melting and just the oh, it sounds horrifying. It's like you're discovering like you're melting, it's like, like perpetual wicked witch of the west situation, man, in a rainstorm. But here's my favorite little detail. I love the, I love the, I love the threat of rain. Remind me of Bugs Life. Remember in Bugs Life in the third act where it starts the rains like SUVs falling. Oh from yeah, the sky absolutely. Practically. Yeah. So when I thought of that, of course, like, one of my favorite sequences in the book, my favorite chapter, of the, probably my favorite chapter of the book involves like the threat of rain. It's like oh god, that's 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 gonna be. Oh boy, and we've set up so well that people, you know, they they don't want to go out in the rain. They're very homebody again, kind of like kind of a current situation of today. They should be named, <laughs> you know, where uh, you know, you know, it's the idea, like you know, you're losing. <clears throat> of course, the, the one of the most horrifying ideas too, like losing your core food, as in, like they sell replacement packs, but you're always going to feel the emptiness that your your food's not going to be there. Somebody who's like kind of perpetually terrified of kind of the loss of body parts is like, oh god, that's. <laughs> That that that, <laughs> that 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 was in, that was kind of getting close too close to home for me and uh, like say some other elements the restaurant business is a big one you probably talk about the restaurant business mm. well I we can but I really like this comment from yeah Matt sure go on yeah yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah yeah let's go we'll, we'll circle um, go on okay uh, he says has anyone considered what it would take to translate it into a traditional Hollywood narrative I would merge the characters into one an- anagram character. Um, I think hybrid between the lobster Malcolm. soldier, the gingerbread man. Uh, yeah, sorry, the gingerbread man, and the uh, the man who figured out the fry box was sending himself through the mail. Dragon, this is a fascinating question to me, man. I I really uh, I kid you not. You know, having an having an amalgam character would be interesting, but I think maybe the way to do it would either be this might be. I think the cop out answer would probably be just to make it as a faux documentary, you know, a mockumentary. Um, but if you wanted an actual narrative, what you could do is you could do it like kind of Magnolia style, where it's sort of like a bunch of different plot threads that kind of tie together towards the end. Hmm. You know what's funny? I actually I I had a thought about, you know, if this thing, because after reading and going through it again for the purposes of today, I was like, you know what, If imagine if this thing were to be adapted as kind of like like, a, like an animated kind of like, like mini series or something. We do kind of a mini series on it. And basically, I can imagine like the Fry Box thing basically being more than kind of three installments. So if we just kind of shrung along as like Fry Box is, is the running narrative and basically we distract from a couple times just kind of checking with the status quo and the event in question. So like, what if we kind of did something like that? But um uh, <laughs> I mean, the Malcolm thing could work. It'd be a really interesting idea as well. Basically, you know, Fry Box being your, you know, kind of your main, your main threat there, and like, I mean, but again, basically, what I, mean, I absolutely think any movie would, uh, any movie, the Fry Box would be the main, the main focus for sure. Absolutely. I mean, he's, I mean, Madman though, he's highlighting some some of the best parts of the book, the Lobster Soldier. My favorite chapter, my favorite whole piece of the whole thing is probably going to be the Gingerbread Man story. Oh my goodness, the Gingerbread Man sure. story. Build to that, but and uh, yes, yeah, thing uh, you know, the officer slice is uh, is who's talking about the man who figured out the fry box. Yeah, those would be kind of compelling stories, kind of unified a little bit by kind of the fry box and the times, and uh, basically the fry, the kind of what the fry box incites with the baghead guys. 
the lobster soldier story. So it all does kind of tie together if you look at it in a certain stretch. You know, legislation that brings people back and uh, it, it, anyway, I'm, yeah. Mm. Cap says, I had no idea about this. Cap's father was a restaurant manager for 25 years. No wonder he had such an in for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, let's circle back around to the uh, the actual service industry. And one of my favorite chapters, absolutely, is the uh, You Are What You Eat Cafe. Yes, that, uh, oh, God, uh, Daryl, Daryl Cack. is very interesting name, Daryl Cack. I, mean, I love, his voice and I, I love the too. horrifying, I love the horrifying implications that you find out about, you know, late in the book about this guy, too. And again, this is just me being a lemming, but again, being so enthralled by the story. I really like this guy. And then, of course, find, oh, my God, he's, <laughs> he's, he's, he's serving dead jello. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but what I really love too, and just in the structure of all this, is again like uh, Manuel Crown. You know, we have the Burgalicious guys. So we kind of we address the. We have like three check ins with the food service. Four if you count the horrifying reveal with with Daryl Keck. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have Bur the Burgalicious discrimination thing. We're basically you know we we you know we don't want to hire like food that's going to basically support the competition or like make us look bad. Or we can't we we can't hire certain foods. And uh, then of course we have Daryl Keck, who's basically had, I think has the most interesting stance of everything. And the reason Daryl Keck kind of I don't. Maybe just, he just charmed me with the whole like I want to make sure that little girl gets what she wants to eat, gets that cotton candy, whatever it was. You know, it's the uh, you know he's tired of the PC culture. He's tired. He makes an excellent point, makes an excellent counter argument. To everybody being weirded out by eating essentially smaller versions of themselves or their friends or their neighbors or their cousins. You know, it's like <laughs> it, it, it's it's this initially ambitious move to remind people, look, you're not the food you eat. Okay, you were turned in the food. That does not make everything you eat you. And he's absolutely mm -hmm. right about that. You know, like don't feel all the you know, like don't you know you know, don't feel uh bad for dining out, you know, like don't don't food shame people. He's very anti food shaming. Yeah, and I feel like the food shaming was probably one of the more political parts of the novel, I would say. Um, I don't want to get into too much of this territory here, but I think it might be a commentary for just how oversensitive our culture is, just generally speaking. Yeah. Of course, the uh, the regular, of course, you know, serving the regular customers is like the special customers, like the whole soil and green is people sort of moment with uh, <laughs> with the, with that jello. Oh my goodness, and the bullet hole in the jello. And I love, I love, I'm sorry, so many details of love in this. We can't love them all, but it's like you know the idea, like you know, like a cop who would keep the bullet in himself is kind of like a little reminder. Something kind of laugh about being a jello cop stuff there and again i like the guy i like kind of how cap frames it too here where it's kind of california versus texas if you open a place like this in california no one had a problem with it all because people get really creative over there you really like you know like you know with the, the molecular gastronomy of it all you know yeah like we're, we're game for anything over here versus texas or you know give me give me the old favorites and of course the old favorites in this case mean oh you can't you can't serve someone who looks like their mother are you nuts <laughs> Dragon, I maybe I'm just when I think Texas dining, I just think steakhouses, steakhouses, yeah. and more steakhouses. <laughs> That's I literally like. Do they have food in Texas besides steak? I mean, look, I, I can't speak authoritatively of that, but I mean, I assume so. <laughs> as far as I've seen, steakhouse, steakhouse, steakhouse. But I mean, let's not, let's not box anyone into a corner, right? Right. <laughs> right. Anyways. All right, let's see. Um, okay, so of course, some other things in world building, pregnancy. We learn the birds and the bees, or more accurately, the cakes and the Cocoa Puffs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that happens. Uh, smart move to have it happen really early on. I imagine that was a, that must have been such a challenge for Cap to write. Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, it's like, thank, thank I do been not watching. envy that writing task. <laughs> Good thing he's been watching the Orville to kind of broach these interesting sci-fi questions. Like, how would, how, how would the reproduction go, necessarily? <laughs> so, so yeah, no, there's, there's in all seriousness though. It's like you—it's know, kind of the horrifying implications of like you know, like before we knew that food babies could develop, you know, like basically giving birth to like a stillborn piece of food. Uh, like oh, I know, God. right? That's that's, that's <laughs> what I'm saying. It's like I love the you know I love kind of the sci-fi approach on on the romance yeah. and procreation kind of post you can post food wave here and we have two, we have two entries here. We have Jennifer sprinkles and these are two really interesting characters as well. Two very different sorts of mothers. Here. Jennifer sprinkles, who is a uh, kind of like, kind of a, you know, kind of a little fancy cupcake, uh, who basically she aspired to be an artist. And again, here's the broken dreams aspect that feeds into the fry box killer. You know, she had this aspiring artist who was now 
who who is now famous for something she didn't want. She's famous for uh, you know, for kind of an embarrassing reason. Like she she kind of invented the birds and the bees for the next generation. Essentially, it's kind <laughs> of she kind of stumbled upon you know the you know the big birds and the bees talk for for you know for the, the foodified instead of like being kind of like lauded for like you know kind of her passions and everything. And she's kind of stuck. And I mean, even being as famous as she is, I I imagine I don't know what the deal is. I imagine she's not getting royalties for these interviews and everyone asking her all these questions. I imagine it's like she's thinking again. She's doing the pizza delivery. I mean, job, to be which, fair, if she makes a t if she makes TV appearances, she's probably getting compensated for that. I would hope so. I'm just saying like, she's still doing the pizza mm-hmm. delivery thing. You'd imagine she'd be still in some of that. I don't know, but then everybody needs a living separate. It might be a passing fad sort of thing. I don't know, but you you you, you right. probably, right. She has she's got to be getting compensated. Right. Anyway, so Tina Stouffer, uh, Tina Stouffer is the other side of the coin here. Tina Stouffer, uh, you intentionally, this is a fascinating thing. So she inspired, and all the women are looking towards or kind of lauding uh, Jennifer Sprinkles as kind of the unsung hero. Like, yeah, this lady, whether she wanted to or not, she's doing something really risky here. You know, she, she, she kind of discovered something new, and also she's bringing new life in the world. And if any, any of us women who want families, we got to abide by this. And again, Tina Stouffer here, very intentionally uh, conceiving. Instead of just kind of looking into it and again, like bracing yourself for the challenges, and of course we get the, again get that whole stillborn risk with the milk bottle. It's like, oh god, my, uh, mm. my I'm the, the the challenges of raising a, like a milk bottle instead of like training your kids who are now turned into milk bottles. You know, that's uh, right. it, it, it kind of l- lamenting on like kind of the next generation of uh, you know, it's kind of the age old question, like what do we do when we bring do we want to bring kids into this sort of world? And again, it's kind of a heady question even now. It's like what what kind of world are we bring these. You know, uh, kids into, especially if they're as fragile as they're ever going to be, and they might need special, special things, and uh, you know, especially like freezer units. Depending if I go, like, oh, like giving birth to an ice cream, I can't even imagine. I mean, I imagine it would be a relatively maybe a painless birth. I don't know. Well, that's a, yeah. At the very least, I mean, yeah, at the very least, logically a lot. A lot, probably a lot more psychologically damaging than physically damaging. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's going to be more. That's <laughs> what they, they, I don't even want to. I don't even want to think about that aspect of like how that's how any of that's going to work. But yeah, so, you know, I. Uh, so again, we. But here's what's interesting though with, with all of this, and again, one of my favorite parts of the prologue, uh, again, like the big tone setter. And that's another thing with Cap that does really good in the writing style as well. So we have we have humor. We have a little bit of our absurdist uh, kind of comedy with again kind of the Ben Edlund '60s Batman kind of flair that Cap has. Uh, where we kind of set up, you know, like in the earlier kind of prologue stuff, we have gags like, I'm a gumball, help! And that's why I keep saying gumball vigilantes, because I really love that line, by the way. <laughs> I'm a gumball, help! <laughs> Versus the, the the most striking moment from the prologue kind of sets the tone perfectly. There's going to be some laughs in here, folks. There's going to be some puns, but there's also going to be some some feels. And the feels being uh, the sausage biscuits is, I was eight months pregnant. Where is my baby? Mm, so right, if you look right, at this story sure. as a whole, you have we, have, we start with the loss of a child, to the discovery of how to make children, to then the creation of new life. So again, past, present, and future. Looking to the future generations, where we were before the, the basically the dawning of the food apocalypse, and and kind of where we're at now. So it's really covered the gambit really well, and kind of like literally the cycle of birth. And speaking of birth, let's talk a little bit about death with, with Don Bacon. Uh, the sausage man, not the sausage king of Chicago, but then again, I'm feeling bad. I can't remember where, where Don Bacon hailed from because if he hailed from Chicago, that's a hysterical reference, anyway. Um, <laughs> god, uh, what was all right, right? So, um, so, uh, so we kind of we, we broached the subject of death and asked him really fascinating, disturbing questions about uh, about the disposal of said bodies because, of course, there's burial, there's cremation, and now there's devouring as an option. <laughs> Oh, God. Oh, man. <laughs> now, I can't remember if Cap really got into Boston Legal. There's this really fascinating episode of Boston Legal. It's uh, where James Spader's character has to argue about, uh, has to argue for a homeless man who, again, he's not bad. I want to make clear, he wasn't a bad guy or anything. But again, it was a homeless man who, I believe, with the consent of his friend who died, said, well, you know, we're both homeless. You know, if I die, eat me. And he ate him. <laughs> and he was oh, on trial Jesus. for that. Oh, was Boston it, Legal? Oh my well, god! Well, again, they didn't show it. It's like the, they 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 take no, they can say still, the most that's horrific. A, that's a risky storyline. Oh man! And that's what I'm saying. And basically, James Spader's character he argued for you know cannibalism not as a horrible thing, but again, as like the man yeah, yeah, chose yeah. not to starve. And again, it wasn't like it was a monstrous thing. And you kind of were looking at it through. I'm really actually interested in watching Boston. Legal. I keep telling you, you gotta try. <laughs> but it's really anyway. So. You can't you can't have a better selling point than like than like voluntary hobo cannibalism. <laughs> anyway, so what, what was all right. the point? Being, I kept thinking of Boston Legal during that chapter because again, some very fascinating questions. Where again, like you know, would you 
like dedicate your you. It's like almost like an organ donor. Like you, know, you, you sell your body to science after you die. That sort of thing. Where it's sort of like, well, you could dedicate. You, know, you could donate your body to like the hungry or to your own right, family right. To, to, to feed them. Or again, like part of the kind of the, the ceremonial thing. You know, like it's, it's almost like that weird thing where sometimes people eat the ashes. They do something with the ashes of of, of the body. Where you know, like it's kind of like mansion. Sure. Yeah, that was that. <laughs> It happens more than you think. Right? I know. I believe it. I believe it. <laughs> and that's what I'm saying. So again, it's like kind of the consumption of, of the body, and it's just it's adding kind of again. We're and of course the fact that the death tolls are going up because of the fragility, both mentally and psychologically. Of course, it leads mm -hmm. to a lot of death, and the consideration being, you know, we're asking all these heady questions more than we have to, more than we ever thought we'd have to. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> right, let's see. Eight. Oh, Tia. <laughs> Which is an excellent question. I can't wait to find out where the baby comes out of. Oh boy! <laughs> well, especially I'm if they're not, if they're I'm, donut I'm, people. I'm, That's I'm, what I really want to know. How does how does that work? If, if someone turns into a donut, how the birth process goes then? But we're not anyway. <laughs> I'm not touching that. <laughs> you're right. You're right. We shouldn't touch it. We're not men of medicine anyway. So let's see. Uh, uh, yeah, go on. I I like a. Uh, Jack Benable has a uh, has a good comment. He thinks it would make a good cartoon. Yeah, I, I could see that. I could see this being something that would work well in like an Adult Swim type of environment. Honestly, absolutely. I mean, let's see Tarakos get his hands on this one. Okay, I will admit when I saw the cover, the first thing I thought of was Frylock. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the thing. I, that's what I love about what, what Cap's done here as well is that we've taken kind of all the parodies of like sentient food, and we, again, we kind of we uh -huh. leaned into it. It's not just like we're not just like, and it happens to be, it happens to be you know sentient food or for like a gimmick or for right, 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 which is very like, much what Aqua Teen is. Aqua Teen is just like look at these over the top characters with really layered and nuanced personalities that happen to be food objects. Certainly. So uh, something that was mentioned earlier, we should probably wrap uh, wrap back to, is that uh, someone uh, I believe. Yeah. I want to say, if I'm reading that comment right, uh, Cap's first, the first food entry that came to mind for him uh, was yes, Oscar yes. Myers. So we talked about Oscar Myers. Yeah, I'm glad you're wrapping around to this because I this was uh, one of my favorite chapters just in terms of the actual prose. Um, I don't know, Dragon. There's just something about the way that Cap wrote about the, uh, you know, like the time and place with the ballpark Franks and how he associated the hot dogs with the ballparks and the nostalgia of that, it, it, it just it really captivated me. I, I Just the actual prose of it itself really, uh, I don't know, I, I, it's hard to put into words for me, but it did something for me. And in the narrative, I love how it perfectly kind of sets the stage for the question of why. Like early on, like there's like the second chapter, we're asking the question of, of, you know, why was I transformed into this? It's kind of a commentary. I think the overall commentary we're putting in the play here that does, by the end of things, once you learn the cause of everything, does make sense. Where you know, kind of the ironic, like choosing the foods and why you become the food that you become. Is that it's a commentary on settling for? I, I I could be reading into it too much here, but I'm gonna I'm gonna throw this out there. Perhaps the Oscar Mayer chapter. The point of it is that it's a commentary on settling for mediocrity and not being able to achieve your dream. Which of course wraps into the fry box thing. That's gonna be kind of like on repeat, folks. And wraps into the fry box thing because it does. <laughs> <laughs> not being able to achieve your dream, but you're addicted to the taste of it. In other words, things I think we're all we're all very much kind of bred, especially you and I, and I'm sure many of the, the fine people of Geek Lush, we're all we're all kind of addicted to nostalgia culture. You know, we're all very we're junkies for nostalgia. We 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 love to reminisce about the things that we loved, and that still we like to go back to. And that's the thing is that, like Oscar Myers is addicted to the taste of nostalgia, which also is is the taste of hot dogs. Which again, like I couldn't cut in the major leagues, but I love the major league franks. You know, the ballpark franks. You know, and it's kind of the question of like a life where you know food is shaped you in a literal sense in this case food has shaped me so much this food shaped me in life and literally is now shaped me in life this is exactly what i'm talking about with the whole like i i, I would turn into a dole whip you know because it's like I, I might not eat dole whips as much as other things but dole whips literally have shaped my identity yeah yeah and again I've, I've i've been to mcdonald's brand all my life so you know i get a you know Center, oh, come on. Pick something more creative than a McDonald's. All right. I, did you want the honest answer or not? Okay, I gave you the honest. I want the creative answer. Oh, I. That'd probably be pepperoni of some kind. Then. 
a oh, I like that, not a pepperoni. That's the thing. Pizza, I can't. I, I, I can't. That's what I'm saying. I can't. I don't know if it's going to be like just a <laughs> stick of pepperoni because I like it sliced. I don't know how that works. I can't be a bull. No, no, I, don't no, know. I like I, it. I, I, I like the. Uh, I, I like the. I, that, that's a pretty unique, uh, a unique choice, Dragon. Basically, it's a 50 50 shot. I mean, again, it's between the McDonald's, which given the. the I, anyway, I don't get drug down <laughs> semantics of like how I was a bull <laughs> work within this world. I don't know. Anyway. Oh, so. God. <laughs> Okay, anyway, uh, let's see. So, Pompey, I think, you know, Oscar Meyer can definitely stand out early on. They definitely kind of hooked you for the story, and it's very, it's very necessary to do that. Uh, let's see. So, of course, in the early chapters as well, we kind of lament on kind of like, you know, the jobs and like how, how jobs are older. One of my, one of my other f all time favorite chapters in the whole book, my favorite documents, Wendy Johns. Oh, my God. The Wendy Johns shares when I knew we were on something really special. Your cap was on something really special with uh, Mike, the, the optimistic Eminem uh, tree trimmer. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, uh, Mike oh, yeah. the Eminem. That's a tragic story right there, and that kind of sing, that kind of summarizes what the whole thing's about there. Where it's this exploration of the, you know, it's the exploration of the physical handicaps uh, that come with people with these occupations that have defined their lives. Where you know it's a, you know, it's just this. You have limits to your regeneration. You feel all the pain if you fear if your shell gets cracked or something. And again, like melting and burns and the rain. That's that's death, man. That's that's, that's those are things that don't that aren't going to heal. And uh, they have this poor melted M and M, like this man who carried the M and M's in the little war tin all these years. And again, like I love how Cap, I love how the author describes the scream, like the scream he let out when he realized he was melting. Like, oh god, that sounds mm. like, like those horrible like radiation burn you've ever heard in your life. Just just reading that. And right. this is the first glimpse at at you know depression post transformation day. To you know, like uh, the dialogue for for the demise of this character is something really really striking. Where you know, I, we're we're doomed. We're manufactured. I worked with nature. I respected it, and it gets this poetic fate of of basically food serving itself to nature with the bear death. Like, oh my God! This is the you know, like the, 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 the I love both both my favorite chapters of the book involve chasing. Like you're chasing after another food <laughs> item and you can't quite make it. And then something ungodly right. happens to the person that you uh, that you are chasing. It's just I don't know what it is. Cap's just master of, of kind of like the not the airport chase, but of just kind of the tragic chase that will not end well. Just mastery of that. <laughs> All right. Uh is that a good transition into your favorite chapter, Dragon? Uh, yeah, I might as well talk about my favorite chapter then. Uh, okay, so let's talk about... Run, run, uh, run as fast as you can. You'll never forget the gingerbread man. Oh, uh, yes. Oh, God, the uh, the gingerbread man. This, uh, my Thomas Mann, this this is a character I already have a lot of support for. It's the idea of the senator who's a little, little uh, you know, kind of regretful of kind of the actions of government, and it's like... We're at a point in the story where the food borders have, uh, the, the, you know, the borders have been reopened. People are coming through, and uh, we're at a point where things have gotten so bad they're fearing civil war. We're now deporting, doing something completely unconstitutional. We're deporting residents of the United States, uh, kicking them out. It's basically, we, the book is so fascinating in how we, we, we kind of do a reverse immigration thing. We're taking the people yeah, who originally yeah, were here, we're kicking them out. On that. Which is like the minority becomes the uh, becomes the ruling class of it all. Yes, and it's again, it's so odd, but it's so fascinating. And this the sad idea that we have. I love that we set up these the, the, Tom and Ken Man. Uh, they're they're these really they're this nice family here. You know, a father was like a diplomat in the war. It wasn't like a gory war here, from what I understand. He was just kind of like a guy who's in the war, did the right thing, inspired his son, and his son became a senator. That's a good story, man. Again, might be me falling for the waffle president thing all over again, but I really this I really like this. <laughs> and I, I love that you know it, it, it's a son going against uh, you know what was kind of. Uh, Going up against this uh, by by doing a treasonous thing, hiding his you know hiding his father, but again just trying. And his father goes gets cabin fever, goes stir crazy, runs out, just goes about his days if nothing's wrong. And we have this horrific thing with the garbage burger man. Oh God! But the, you know the burger trash man, however you want to phrase that. Point being, this oh God, this is the most this is the most haunting scene in the whole book for me. The fact that it's kind of it's. I, I know it's not technically the penultimate chapter. It's really the penultimate chapter followed by kind of two other <laughs> ones. Yeah. So, you know, we, we have, uh, you know, it's the desperation in the fragile gingerbread man chasing after his father. Well, some people have always looked at the gingerbread man story as if you look at the, you know, the baker as the father, you kind of have a little bit of a father-son element that. I don't know if that was the inspiration. Probably not. But I, this the merciless sequence of, of, the, of this burger man abusing this, this, this poor human, this human man. 
and and throwing them in a garbage truck again. Basically, it's like the food the food that constantly gets thrown out, saying no, I'm throwing them, I'm throwing man out. So again, it's like a perfect a perfect effigy for basically how we've turned the tables on the status quo now. Where we're literally throwing the people away, and the food's doing the throwing away. Exactly. Exactly. And he's just abusing and killing an oh, innocent man. man so his kids can sleep at night. And I, I love how like the burger's not making any apologies, but he ain't going to be taken down. Like, he has the tasers. Like, I hate me, too. I hate me, too, kid. Yeah, this is exactly the kind of stuff, like, the kind of fiction that just gets you kind of, like, you know, almost, like, riled up against humanity in a good way. You know what I mean? Like, you're, I was. Reading, you're just like, like, oh, fuck people, you know? Oh, I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm, I probably shouldn't swear on this, but, well, I guess the day people swear on the book, so, you know, fair game, I guess, anyways. That, that they do. <laughs> and that's the thing, so. I, that, that's the thing, I, I, I love that, it's just, it's so, you're right, though, it is so engrossing, and that, you know, the, this man can't get justice for his father, for the burger that murdered his father, it'd be very easy to prove, but he can't do it. It's like, being all he did was be human, that was his crime, is to be human, it's, oh, uh, it's infuriating. <laughs> he kept the secret for the sake of his wife and his son a little bit of for himself because he thought he could make a difference and the, the, he stuck with the, the residual nightmare of his father's corpse coming after him and taunting with the old gingerbread man story. It's like, oh, God, it's it's a, it's a poor fate for this character. And I'm thinking, like, again, like if I were in his shoes, too, again, I wouldn't I, I didn't consider like, oh, yeah, I'd be a gingerbread man with a bum leg right now. But I don't know. If, again, if, if I'm going up against a man like a giant burger with a taser like I. I, I'm not gonna be able to stop him. I would have, I would have killed him. But I'm, I'm thinking in a human sense, I would have been able to kill that burger. But no, I, I, it, 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 it's tragic and it's per the world view, it's like, oh my goodness, it's mm -hmm. powerful stuff. Just absolutely, just the top notch stuff. Speaking yeah, keep of some, saying it was, it was kind of unnatural for him to write so much, uh, so much swearing, but it seemed appropriate. Yeah, Cap, that that was uh, very much. This whole book kind of felt like it was a little bit out of the. Uh, you know, the normal James Logan family-friendly playbook in a good way. You know, it, it had that Captain Logan charm of, you know, the uh, the very analytical perspective, but it was very, very R-rated, too. It was, I, I, I very much enjoyed that, Cap. It was nice to see kind of like a different side of you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, let's see. Um, I mean, uh, earlier we, the lobster was mentioned. Perhaps we should talk about kind of the overall, like the baghead butchers, basically the uh, kind of the, the kind of the uh, kind of terrorist group that that kind of caused a whole lot of stuff, including the uh, including the big uh, Brandon, uh, the big uh, Brandon Rock sequence. Which, by the way, if I confirm this, Brandon Rock, little nod to Cap's friend, Brandon Grimm. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> There's also a Sarah in the book. I assume that. I know. I kept thinking. Right? I kept trying to ask, and I just like I, I believe one of the little girls from the uh, from the earlier chapter, way back in seven, uh, one of the little kid testimonials, was uh, was oh. like Sarah the little donut. So I wonder if I wonder if that was a nod to uh, you know his Sarah, but you know Sarah, yeah, Jurassic Park. Oh God, anyway. <laughs> Sarah. <laughs> God. <laughs> Cat okay, makes an excellent point. I don't think I could have written this without Spawn here. I believe that. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, popsicle sticks, man. I mean, what else? <laughs> and there's, there's your, there's your cross section. Popsicle sticks, edible states. There's your, anyway. But, so, anyway, so baghead butchers. So, what, what, how do you feel? We have like the Lawrence affair, the whole, the whole part. Well, show first that. of all, the Brandon Rock situation is like the most compelling scene that was never in the Netflix Punisher show. I'll, I'll put it that way. I mean, you outside gotta, of the anthropomorphized food, it very much plays out like Netflix Punisher Dragon. I love the story behind uh, this this rock character. I love the idea that he is uh, you know, he's sort of like his own. He's like a Steve Rogers story almost. It's like a Steve Rogers story uh -huh. turns into Frank Castle almost. It's kind of a, kind of a cross between that, where it starts off like he was kind of a pro, kind of a probably a weak private in the military, and then of course food wave hits. He's a very durable lobster, very useful lobster. Who again, you know, war right. that's now easier right. to fight than ever before. Years blasting. I food, love that is... idea that lobsters basically have built in armor. That's that's great. Yeah, yeah. And uh, of course, we it leads to the big uh, the big school showdown with Dean. Oh, god, Dean is one of the most second to the fry box killer, man. Dean is the most terrifying character in this piece. He's the Montgomery de la Cruz dragon. That he is. 13 reasons why for all the oh, kids yeah. out there. Oh, I got you. <laughs> <laughs> God. 
<laughs> okay, anyway, that was so, a really weird reference. <laughs> yes, yes, it was. But <laughs> anyway, so so let's talk about Dean first. Let's talk about why Dean's so horrifying. For those of weak constitutions, you may want to like you know, go ah, 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 for a couple seconds here because it's going to get really dark. Okay, so uh, Deany boy here, uh, Dean, uh, you know, he's eating children and holding them hostage. And I don't know how's it getting worse than that. I'm going to tell you how he, he's, he's very playing very traumatic mind games with him, essentially using the kids as a way of selecting which other small school children he should eat next. And also Dean ain't the fry box. He, he, he is a human being who is eating sentient food, which just makes all. Oh. <laughs> so it, it, that's like eight shades of terrifying. Right? And this is like really the point of the novel where it's like, okay, Food and normal people cannot coexist. Probably not a good idea to open the borders. Yeah. Oh boy. And again, it's all of this. And again, basically, we learn through the fry box thing and kind of the psycho kind of like exposition kind of thing towards the end there. We learn that the fry box is, I believe, technically he incited the, the he kind of built up the baghead butchers and the whole Lawrence affair. Basically, kind of the riot that went on. The woman asking, like, I wonder if my husband, if he, if he would, if he would, uh, spare me and, and all this chaos and it's kind of it's almost this scare like red hoods or quarter of Owls thing from the scott snyder batman like anyone could be mm -hmm. could be one of them you know you don't know if your loved ones are and if you have any human loved ones chances are they could be a terrorist or they could end up not a terrorist but still grave danger like poor kenneth man <laughs> <laughs> all right so, but actually you're right absolutely right about your punisher comparison though just there's the thrilling absolutely thrilling and and, and just that sequence. in the barber shop where the two big punisher things for me Oh yeah, well I'll, we gotta talk about the barber thing soon because the barber things are one of the other. Like if they had like a top five chapters from the book, man, bar the Frank the Frank the Barber's in there, man. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. So of course, uh, just you know the, the terrifying sequence, and we learn a little bit about Dean, what possibly drove him off the deep end, where he mentions that his wife ate his son. Oh God, yeah, and that's what I'm talking about with the Punisher of it all, man. It's like you know just such a horrific event, you know, like that would push anyone off the edge. And he just doesn't see why not. And of course, the biggest thing, the most, the most really gritty thing, and again, is like the fact that it's different than killing food when you kill your first human. Which again, this guy, because he was so green in the military initially, never thinking up. It's like a big like you don't want to go touting off. I killed people in the military, which you don't want to do that. No one wants to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But right. uh, the fact is, I mean, chances are, you know, he's, he's kind of green in that regard, and he's seen she shot food before, but never, never a human being. Is the fact he unloads on 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 this completely reprehensible person. And the fact that he offered him help, though, speaks to the character of this of this Brandon Rock character. Again, Cap, if we're talking sequels and spinoffs and so on and so forth, I think I think Brandon Rock might have a following in a, a building here. He might, he might, <laughs> in, just, just in case. I think Brandon yes. Rock oh, to go back to that to go back to that earlier question. I think Brandon Rock could be a good uh, a good foil to the fry box killer. Uh, that's a that's a good. I didn't think about it. You're right. Yeah, it's a good call. So Cap uh, makes an excellent uh, pull here with uh, the barber shop. No wonder we liked it so much. Heavily inspired by Luke Cage. That yeah, it definitely had some sort of Marvel Netflix flair to it. <laughs> <laughs> and again, there is kind of the Switzerland quality of of, of, of the barbershop from Luke Cage in, in that scene. Yeah, yeah. Well, so yeah, make that that tracks. It makes perfect sense. It, so, Frank it was one of the more the, it was one of the more fascinating like socio political chapters in the whole thing. Um, just kind of like exploring, you know, what it means to be human. Almost, you know, it, it's really deep stuff. It's like kind of like, hey, kids, you want a chapter about the meaning of life and how we interact with each other? Here you go. Yeah, my God, you know, Frank Cubs, you're just this folksy string cheese barber, you know, he's, he kind of has a Breaking Bad moment almost, where he talks about the perfect mm -hmm. moment, he, like the perfect day to die, what he imagined his last day would be, you know, he's buying everybody lunch, you know, he's watching kids play Frisbee, and then, you know, dead, but, you know, he just, you know, he can't, he just wanted to leave a world similar to the one he came in, no matter how much technological innovation came by, fundamentally, things were still the same, not anymore. The man can never can never go out on the on the terms he had dreamed of all his life. Which again, failed dreams. Theme of the book. I refer you back to Frybox Killer. <laughs> so, <laughs> running gag, folks. Apologies. So, but no. Seriously, though, this is um, I, we're kind of addressing something we are kind of currently going through here again by sheer coincidence, but still effective sheer coincidence. The whole non-essential business woes, where again, mm -hmm. Barber without any hair to cut. 
unfortunately, not essential. I think we're all feeling that right now. About, about the time we're all of our hairs are either in buns or going, they're, they're going down to our ankles at this point. Just getting out, guys, going to get terrible until till things you know, get fixed on that end of things. But regardless, yeah, it's bad. It's bad. I believe I it. almost, I'm almost considering shaving my head, Dragon. Believe it or I, not. I, I, I know of that mindset, but <laughs> okay. I've done it once before. I know you have. I know you have. <laughs> So let's see. So, uh, so, the, so now, we, now that the regulars, now the board has been opened, and again, I love this is right after the big, the big plea from uh, from uh, Trevor Oates here, saying uh, like, please don't, uh, you know, please, Miss President, do not, if you're reading this, do not open the borders. It's a bad idea. You know, things, civil wars, essentially, an internal civil war is going to break out right after that chapter. We get Frank Cubs, like the perfect example of. With regular people back, it's, it's going to cause a whole litany of problems. But good news, businesses can cut hair again. They can do things for the regular customer. Day is saved, you'd think. In reality, we get to the day, as Frank calls it, the day in which Jake, the ex-Marine, is accosted by the hotheads. And the hotheads are, are you know, the, the, the spicy chicken sandwich and the hot wing. And oh my goodness, I... <laughs> the Punisher comparison you made earlier is just so perfect. It's the cracking of the chicken bone, the cracking of the hot wing. Yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. And like, full-on Chewbacca ripping, ripping the arms off. It's like, oh man, it's but then I, I, I love the interaction that Frank has afterwards, you know, how he's just like, I look, I, I I can acknowledge that, you know, I understand why you went off the deep end, but still it makes me deeply uncomfortable. Yeah. I mean, you know, here's the thing. I, I was sympathetic to Jake, but excessive mm -hmm. force. I mean, not just the excess. I mean, there's, there's excessive force and then there's like, you know, like there's raining it in, you know, <laughs> just, he didn't. Right. Right. I mean, Okay, like, there's ripping the guy's arms off, and I mean, look, they were causing a lot of trouble, but I mean, like, the whole terrifying threat to eat him and the whole, like, you, you, if you ate me, that'd be unforgivable, but I had one of you yesterday, and takes a bite out of him, that, that, that's a step too far. <laughs> <laughs> and again, we're, we're there's some excellent parallels for you know, racism and kind of some ep economic jealousy in the job market here, where you took our jobs. And I love that's a, this is what I'm liking about Jake initially. Like he's being really civil about it initially, saying, "I took both of your jobs." Is that is that what happened? I mean, of course, no, it's not at all what happened. He's basically taking the juice from their argument, hoping to diffuse the situation a little bit. There it does not go as such. <laughs> So basically, humanity itself is losing its humanity, and it's a really interesting idea. And the fact that Frank witnessed all of this and it's just very haunting that our poor folksy barber, and everyone loves well, everyone loves a folksy barber, don't they? Who doesn't, Dragon? Come on! I'm now. saying we all we all have we all have no or have seen a folksy barber in our time, and just seeing a folksy barber get just kind of witness such cruelty in his own shop in his Switzerland, as it were, is just that that there's no coming back from that. Mm. All right, Dragon. I'm, I, as far as I can think, we've pretty much covered the gauntlet of like all the major stuff. Um, if there's anything else in the comments that people want us to discuss, by all means, now would be the time. Uh, Dragon, anything else you can think of that we well, haven't gotten into yet? Well, before we get to kind of the final stuff, like talking about the ending and the, the absolute how of it all, um, perhaps like, I got one. I think I got one more thing. Uh, the Hollywood system. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. That that was uh that was rather interesting and another thing that kind of like mirrors the current situation that we're that we have going on. I mean, not necessarily, but you know, still the current situation we are very much uh kind of the Hollywood system is very much up in the air about what's gonna be done about that. Anyways, I digress, Dragon. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, we have like, you know, the idea of like we're finishing movies with you know CGI and motion capture, because again, we just need to simulate, you know, human actors where we don't have them anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, at that point in time, before we let the regulars back in, before they had a solution to that. And going forward, you know, the, the, we're retelling, basically retelling stories. Basically, the, the idea we're going to be stuck telling the same stories going forward, like the status quo change. Like, it's going to be, like, hey, we have to have a, come up with an explanation behind why, why are all the actors food now? It's like, it was a dream, and, you know, the comatose pitch for a movie. Oh, God. He wakes up and he's toast. Right, right, right. And, right. and uh, it's, it's the fact that we've limited the range for the actors, and the thing that cracks me up so much. Again, infusing a little bit of humor in things here. I just love the idea, of, like franchises are going to keep going on with, with you know, for like the Avengers, for example, will be like you know Captain America's now. <laughs> He was now hey man, uh, Marvel Zombies is a thing, you know. So it is, it is. So you know, Captain America as an apple oh God, pie. I love the idea. Iron... I love the idea of Cap as a pie. That's great. And Iron Man as a cheeseburger, which is perfect. <laughs> 
Uh-huh. <laughs> of course, Hulk, Hulk is jello. But importantly, though, I imagine Cap, he's, he's not getting the end game but by the time he's writing the Sora thing. Again, this has been developed for a while, folks. I'm imagining he's just sure, going sure. through this. Like, I don't know, it's just it's some things like that. It, it, it's a lot of fun, though. And of course, talking about like, the forthcoming Star Wars, now that's going to go. It's, it, it, it's, it's very difficult. Oh, hey, here's something. Comatose is a Sarah pun. Sarah had the idea for that. And earlier, by the way, Sarah was a coincidence. Sarah is like one of the favorite names Caps like, like likes to use for time from time to time. Okay. Of course, just you know, things worked out for him in life. They met a Sarah. It's called a destiny, call it fate, <laughs> whatever you will. I, I, I don't want to get in the way of that. So, I only finished the first draft in 2017. That's good. Oh, wow. So, this has been in works for quite a while. Nice. Nice. It has. Let's see. Um, let, do you want to scroll back and see if we missed any topics people wanted us to get to? Um, yeah, sure. I, I, I'm on it. I'm on it. All right. Okay, you got it. All right. Let's I see. Mean, let I me think see. we pretty much covered everything, honestly. Let me let, let me go through and see if there's any any real eye catchers that we haven't gotten to yet. Because I literally have them all listed. Uh, you, well, we already talked about the hard candy vigilantes and that Bradley Fu chapter. Let me put it this way: again. we love we love Captain. I love the audiobook. and honestly, I think Cap did the best he could. And again, I'm not. We shouldn't judge the book based on the audio because again, it's a book before it's an audio book. Mm -hmm. But uh, that said, though, I mean the Bradley Fu chapter was a little weird. Let's be honest. You know the the fortune cookie guy. Hmm. I don't know. I, I, I like that. But you know why I liked it is I like the whole concept of uh, of the fortune kind of being a part of him. You know what I mean? Like the, the I love uh, the idea of the, the fortune cookie. I'm just fortune. saying literally the performance is like the only one of the few times like, yeah, if Cap could outsourced per, to the voice actors, perhaps. I believe that oh, would be a thing that was in Honestly, I'd, I'd have to go back and listen to it again, honestly. I mean, to be honest with you, I didn't really notice it being all that off. So I don't know. No, I'm just saying again. What I'm saying is like it'd be interesting if we if 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 Cap ever did another version of the audiobook where he got you know voice actors to kind of like you know do the voices. That'd be very interesting, you know, because I heard there was some interest from the folks at Geek Evolution. They kind of like throw they submit their you know new t tapes and stuff for for uh, you know like if if they're taking another pass at and kind of and have the audio kind of brought to life in different voices and stuff. That'd be very interesting. If, uh -huh. At the very least, if if the book never got an animated adaptation, which again, fingers crossed, perfect world, we adapt all the good stuff. But you know, sometimes. Life isn't that. But, you know, if, if, if there was ever, like, kind of a radio drama version of this, like, we took, like, another radio drama version where, you know, we kind of bring the theater of the mind to the next level, you know, the quake to this would be, it'd be kind of interesting. It's just, just saying. Just throwing it out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the thing. He's mentioned the whole high pips. I mean, Cap, don't sweat it, man. Like, we're... But Again, I think it works fine enough. Yeah, like it's I just, said, Cap, yeah. I didn't really even, like, it, for me, I didn't even really notice it. Or, or, you know, I, not to say I didn't notice it, but it wasn't like, it wasn't bothering me at all. So, yeah. yeah I mean, Cap's doing essentially 31 deal. voices here. And he's exactly. Not Ralph, he's not Ralph Garman. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I have no, I have no. <laughs> No blame, no no blame. There, I'm just, I'm just saying, it's the only <laughs> one that seems like, out of all the voices, I, I don't know, it's a little, little odd. That's all, but it, 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 it works for the story. It works enough. Let's see. Um, I'm just going down here. We, yeah, we did really, man. We really ran the gambit on this, and we covered a we lot. We really did, um, man. <laughs> I was literally going down the list here. I'm just, uh, well, Ted. Okay, I didn't care. How did you feel about Ted Gill? Like the the Arby's, the the Florida bro guy, Ted Gill. Like, Again, this playing into the humor of things. Here we have like the guy. Talking, I was, I was, I'm a, I turned, I turned into a fish sandwich. And I was made, learned what I was making out my girlfriend in the movie. I don't know. I could take or leave it. I didn't have. Strong opinions of that chapter, either way. Honestly, yeah, I'm saying I think it's lost in the shuffle once we get into kind of like kind of the ethical ethical dilemmas and everything. And that's what I'm saying. Like third act is, is super impressive, man. Like in terms of how the acts, you know, act one just kind of gets you into the into the flavor of how, how things are, and again a little bit of lightheartedness, a little bit of the kind of the punny humor, and then we go further and further, and things get a little bit more interesting and defined in act two. Then things get super interesting and really dark in act three. It's really good, really, really good structurally. Mm -hmm. In that regard, all right, okay. Well, I guess, um, oh, yeah, you know, again, I'm well, guys, I might be crazy. Don't listen to me, Jack. Jack, uh, be nimble here. Says, you know, I like the food boys. And again, the food boys, it's it's okay, just that thing outshined by like the fry box killer voice. You know, I think, uh, kind of, I know, some things probably came more natural, the more impassioned he got about it. Um, sure, sure, all right. So, uh, I guess let's talk about the ending then. So, the, the, the how of it all, the sci fi of it all, so the sci fi explanation, then the ending. Um, so sci fi explanation, all uh, you know, it's it's it, really cool like I, I like how uh, i already mentioned how like kind of the religious assumptions that come from things kind of being covered up a little bit which of course gives birth to the fry box killer but i love how we learn about the multiverse thing how do you feel about the multiverse uh, aspect of the story 
I mean, I you know, I got to admit, I uh, when I first kind of was speculating about the Indian, I had a feeling that it was going to be some sort of uh, some sort of machine that caused it, you know, some sort of sci-fi machine. I did not see the multiverse thing coming at all, though. I mean, that was a uh, that was definitely a twist. Yeah, in terms of how I feel about it, I mean, I, 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 yeah, I do think it works. I agree. I, uh, I, uh, I, you know, what I like about it is I like how it makes the multiverse of it all kind of makes everything very open ended. You know what I mean? In a good way, it's kind of, it really does kind of take the whole story, kind of contextualize it into this sort of morality, sort of Twilight Zone esque thing. Yeah, I really like how the idea is that the deeper, at least the way I read it, is that the deeper you get in the multiverse, the further away from humanity you get. Like, it's less humanoid, it's less like, you know, kind of the classic multiverse we all think of, where it's like, what if you did something differently? And it kind of creates a whole nother, that sort of multiverse. This is like, you're going like deep, deep, deep. It's like, okay, what if you did this, but you weren't even of that species? You're like of an alien species, then it kind of removes itself. There we get to like, I think it's like the Plith, the Plith Scots or something. I believe that's what, what the racist name is. These guys. I, you know I me. Mean? I'm all. I'm a gadget guy. I love. I love the. I love. This is the expedition I really dig, man. This is, this is sort of like you know the explanations I love here with this whole. Um, the idea. The, this, there's this race of people that had a torture device, the vice grip. This already sounds unpleasant. <laughs> <laughs> the vice grip. I mean, if you've seen Casino, you know, never mess around with the vice grip. But again, well, let alone a sci-fi vice grip. So the vice grip here. Yeah. So the, basically, um. The the, uh, the the vice grip essentially is a device that you know, replicates the seven deadly sins, which basically has uh, junk food uh, basically as a representation for gluttony within the seven deadly sins. Mm -hmm. I can only imagine what the other seven deadly sins would have done to people. Again, oh, I maybe, know. Sequel, spinoffs. Yep. Again, like Shazam right now is eating its heart out. Well, another, sorry, another food pun, eating its heart out. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, Shazam is like, oh, why didn't we do this with the seven deadly sins? Ah, oh, stop it, stop it. <laughs> I just keep going back to seven myself when I think of the gluttony thing. Sure. And, uh, and basically we learn, uh, you know, the architects, so basically we kind of, we, there's speculation about how this device would be applied to kind of foodifying like a whole, like a whole nation. So then we go to uh, the architect, the architect being kind of our big guy here. The architect, of course, uh, having modified the device, uh, you know, at the cost of his entire family fortune, like a number of like almost Rick, Rick Sanchez level amount of favors, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he did all this essentially to shake people from apathy, uh, you know, after his mm -hmm. wife passed away from E. coli. So you know, love is kind of the motivator here, the loss of a loved one and kind of finding someone to blame and finding someone in the form of uh, kind of the food service and there's someone has to be held accountable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, and, and the, this things get interesting with, with the architect here. So he planned it's So how do you feel about him being, he planned on turning everyone back if they band together in kind of like a post 9-11 situation and like something really bad happens to us we yeah, all come that together was one of the more interesting things with the uh that was one of the more interesting things about the end of the book for me was the fact that it was very much like a screw you in terms of like once the border thing sort of uh happened and once you know once immigration started to happen it was very much just like that whole third of the book dragon that whole last third of the book is very much just like Oh my God! This is just a part of my French. This is just a shit show. You know, it's very much like we. I mean, had civil war on the home fluid. front. I mean, you guys couldn't <laughs> keep it together for you know for that right, long. Right, right. So I, I like that idea. I like the idea that the whole time there was an out, and it was our fault essentially that we didn't get the out. Yeah. Oh, this is something really interesting. Cap brought up here. We should. I had no idea about this. Um, the multiverse is from his first novel. Uh, Big Bear brings up in the in this book. He brings up a couple of species and characters from from the book. And the and the Pliscots are kind of our masterminds behind the vice grip. Are from that book. It's all. Oh my goodness, folks. I mean, if a multiverse didn't sell you enough, interconnected universe, cinematic universe of of of, of James Logan books, kids. I mean, you know, move, move over. Other books. We should series. go back and review the first book sometime. We should. We should. All right. Um, well, I, I want to say, Cap, do you do you have three books out at this point? Is this the third for you? Because you have this seven, uh, the, the girl with the seven first names. Sorry, with seven first names. The girl with seven first names. <laughs> and uh, no, so it's uh, there's three books in Cap. I think the reason why we're getting that screwed up is because of the girl with the dragon tattoo. And, uh, yeah, now I feel <laughs> that the extra buff. Uh, 
<laughs> yeah, that's the extra that I'm play for that one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I swear to you, I feel so I feel so silly because just show you how like, in Geek Pollution the first ten years has passed already, folks. Is Jack Jack be nimble here brings up normal as a four letter word and it's like when he said that it's like wait a minute, normal is a four letter. Oh my god, that's you know, the first yeah the book from way back when. Yeah, it's been going for yeah. that long. All right. Um, all right. So speaking speaking of the ending, so okay, let's talk about kind of so we had very I I equate like a Watchmen esque choice for our ending for the president here. So this is where we get really full circle. I love that we we have two full circle endings: a full circle ending for the for the chapter for you know, document one, as well as a full circle ending for the for the prologue. And you can both, if you wanted to cut out the prologue and the epilogue, you'd still be satiated. But boy, oh boy, folks, you got two good endings for the price of one here. So let's so the, so uh, the president's choice here. What is the president's choice, Diggy? president's choice is to uh go ahead and push the button yes there's a second button that essentially will even out the playing field as and there's going to be no more of this the civil war stuff that you screwed up in the first place here it's going to like you know we're going to even the playing field everyone's food global global food wave everyone again same as it was before the ironic naming you know the life choice it's all going to factor into kind of the gluttony kind of the global gluttony of it all and uh, basically, this time, you know, it, it, uh, the choice is on you, though. Do you want to keep going as you're going right now and just hope things get better? Or are you going to be be active, like make leadership mean something? President, not by committee. President, by the guy who makes the big decisions. The guy who literally decides whether or not to push the button. Which, again, I think there's some parallels there to again, like a guy being kind of tasked with a really big choice of the push of a button. Sure, sure. It's not like we can relate to that at all in our current time, Dragon. Oh no, heavens no! I mean, uh, well, it's crazy talk. <laughs> but there's, there's, I, I really like the, I, I love the open-ended uh, quality of, of, of the story. Oh yeah, the idea that, that it's I, very I really, Twilight Zone for me, Dragon. It's very Twilight Zone. I'm of two minds about something here. It's not, a, I'm not a negative sense here. I'm of two minds because I, I kind of like it one way. I, I could, I can, I'm happy with it both ways here. Or part of me would prefer if it was open-ended, kind of like, oh, like a Watchman, oh, like a Seymour with the Rorschach journal, you know. And uh -huh. you know, we're, yeah, we don't know where it ends. And again, we've seen how bad it is, like with the Civil War, kind of a brewing here, and uh, again, trampling on kind of the constitutional rights and everything, and just the you know, we have fry box kills, and probably more on the way. And the, and the, the, the what I feel what they're, oh god, the uh, like the fry box killer had like a fan club. I forget what its name right now. It's like not fry heads. I'm thinking like Fred heads from Nightmare on Elm Street, but it was like something. You know, the point being. <laughs> anyway, um, point being, um. You know, we had, you know, with the inspired the you know, the, uh, the 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 baghead butchers like surely there's going to be more of those guys. The point being, we're in kind of a terrible state right now. Then we get the epilogue. Now, the epilogue again, it's sort of like Watchmen then versus uh, Watchmen post Lindelof, and again both are good. <laughs> Where again post you know, pre you know, pre Lindelof, we could have ended it up. We could have ended right there. And again, if you don't believe in the epilogues, you could just end it right there, keep it ambiguous. But we do get an epilogue that confirms where things ended up. You know, the, we get an answer that, okay, he pushed the button. We're getting global text now, which is hysterical. And again, in a really kind of darkly cosmic way, yeah, he really pushed the button because the story the story's not interesting if he doesn't push the button. Okay, you know what that ending kind of reminds me of, Dragon? It reminds me of the ending of Little Shop of Horrors, where essentially the planet the plant just devours the whole planet, and that's the end. Yeah, it's you're just right. like, okay. <laughs> like, all right, we're we're all screwed. Just throw our just throw the hands up here, people. There's no way out of this. This is a bad situation here. Also, thanks for clarifying, Cap. So it is just two books. Normal is is the girl with seven first names. It's um it was uh -huh. changed in the publishing. So that's it. Oh, it seems I very much agree with his sentiment of Spawn Year as a second novel, though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> given how much went Spawn into Year that, was I an mean, undertaking. <laughs> I, I swear, if I ever see Todd McFarlane, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask him about Spawn Year, but I just have, oh, I have, I have not gotten the opportunity. <laughs> All right. So uh, let's let's see. Uh, all right, right. So, um, so of course, I, with the the text specifically, kind of the final text of the thing, you know, we have full circle kind of prologue. Uh, as I already mentioned, we already kind of went to full circle with the global response. I love my favorites of, of all the of the text and everything are, you know, Big Bear saying, "I told," essentially saying, "I told you so." Like, oh man, I wonder who could have called this. Like, you believe me now? <laughs> and uh, the, the, my, I think the most clever, one of the most clever kind of narrative things we do in our prologue and our epilogue here. I love how the White House has a comment where the White House essentially covers up that we have no idea. We, we the audience, know. okay, absolutely, the White House did this. It's like, oh, man, that's dirty pool right there is covering up. The, we made a big choice. We're not going to live with the public. You know, we're going to keep the secret that, yeah, we pushed the button. We did this. 
Uh, yeah. We're there for you, and that's yeah, you're there for us. And of course, like the guy in like the plastic wrapping business is like, oh man, I'm gonna make a killing. You know, we're selling tarps and everything. This is this is our year. <laughs> the one the one business that's prospering, much like the kind of the, you know kind of the mask and glove business at the moment, I suppose. You know, uh, and, and of course, at the end, we kind of we kind of pull almost uh, kind of a vague Rodney King, as it were. You kind of pull you know, at the end, can't we all just get along? You know, which again is kind of the sentiment of the whole book. You know, if we can all just get along, you know, one we possibly could have been turned back, and it's a question like how far gone are we? It's it's a, can't we all just get along? Which is kind of sentiment we always want, kind of in the world. Like, can't we all just put aside the, the 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 divided BS and just like you get on the same page? Like we're all human, or in this case, we're all food. Are we good now? <laughs> Whatever end or the store really speeches. Yes, <laughs> you know. <laughs> oh, and of course, uh, T Edge here. My mom used to, used to say normal is the setting on a washing machine, which sounds like a suicide squad pool. Probably is a suicide squad pool, but I'll take it. <laughs> All right, let's see. Uh, Bag Studios, a few interesting comments here because we're about to kind of wrap up. And yeah. these guys, anything you really want to talk about, by all means, get it in now, and we'll talk about yeah, it. Now's the folks. time. Now's the time. Love you, folks. We had we had no place to be. <laughs> so let's see. Uh, Bag Studios. I don't know why the publisher would change that title. Normal is a four-letter word is a catchier title. Hey, I really, I, I really do like that title. I too. kind of agree. I mean, I no, nothing against the girl with uh, with seven. It's an names. interesting title, the seven name. Yeah, you know? it's intriguing. But no, I really like the title of uh, you know, of normal is a four-letter letter word. That's that's very eye-catching. Yeah. Okay, Bags do is he's weighing in on the whole uh, and the, kind of the uh, you know kind of the epilogue versus the ending here. Where I, I like that we get an answer here. It gives Deer and Water a character change, a moment of you know, moment for change. Whereas the characters and Watchmen are introduced uh, for the point of for the point of that ending. So that's that's an excellent point. It gives Deer and Water a big kind of like he gets to see his actions. He gets like an opportunity for change. That is that's a nice way of looking at it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I like TH's sentiment here. Uh, my mom used to say normal is just a setting on a washing machine. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Okay. So I guess. Uh, hmm. Sorry, Mr. I, won't, I, I just feel paranoid we're forgetting something outside of some fun food puns here. You know? <laughs> I swear to God, we went through the whole book, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think we're good. <laughs> all right. Okay I, guess, okay. I guess we're good. I mean, I, all right. Okay. Let's okay, see. Uh, the author in the chat here. If if we miss something, I think he pointed out to you know us. What? That's an, I, you know what? I know. I know. It's kind of like the old the old writer conventions of the author supposed to sit in the back of the classroom and he's supposed to you know he's not supposed to say anything as people discuss the book. But you know what? I'm gonna break the connection. I'm gonna ask him something. Uh, Captain Logan, dear author, sir, is there anything that we have not talked about that you really, really are on pins and needles one? <laughs> weighed in on that you'd like us to discuss if you got anything we've done our jobs say so if not if you really want to know something <laughs> well, please let us know and we will satiate you sir because you satiate us with all this food in 31 flavors or less yeah yeah <laughs> otherwise we're gonna break in the um, phone thoughts, but not yet we're pretty much pretty much let's all go to the lobby <laughs> let's all go to the lobby oh man Oh God, Dragon! By any chance, did you uh, did you ever see the Aqua Teen movie? I not the movie. I've seen a few episodes of the show. My favorite, like my favorite, I can't really say favorite because I barely watch any of the show. I saw. I love Patrick. Uh, uh, Pat, sorry, I love Pat Oswald. Pat Oswald had this had this hysterical episode where he plays like I think the milkshake's like nephew or his, I no the milkshake had a son for an episode and it's, it's, it's Pat Oswald's performance is hysterical in that. Uh, Cap asked if there were too many pop culture references. Uh, Cap, I, I don't think so, honestly. Uh, you know, I've read a lot of books where it has, like, kind of overabundance of pop culture references. I mean, Ready Player One is kind of the obvious one. But uh, honestly, my, my uh, the, the guy who manages my bookstore has kind of steered me towards books where I'm like, all right, this is okay, but it's a little bit of a pop culture encyclopedia. And Cap, I did not feel that from this. I mean, I think I think all the pop culture just really helped to uh, illustrate the role building. So yeah, genuinely, I don't think there were too many pop culture references. I mean, Cap, we literally are kind of like you're at a point now where we are just kind of a pop culture, well, culture. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> but no, no, but no, seriously, I will say this though. If you're curious, there are only two there are two things I want to highlight in terms of the pop culture reference. One I was really pleased by it was it was an, it was a very unique pool, but I loved it. The Jessica Jones reference when, when uh, Ted Gill was mentioning Carrie Ann Moss is a chick from Jessica Jones. <laughs> I, I, I bear, bear in mind we've kind of recapped all the Jessica Jones episodes, so yeah, I don't know. Oh, maybe we, oh, yeah, yes, we, we just appreciate that. I don't know. I mean, I thought it was nice. There's only one reference I felt was a bit of a buy, where I think a general audience can really get into this and be able to follow on the pop culture. And again, we've all at least heard of the Marvel movies, if not I've seen them. We've all let's face it, we've all seen the Marvel movies, at least some, at least one of them in our lifetime at this point. Um, but the Watcher pool, I think that was the only one where it's I'd say it's a little bit that little bit of kind of like geek evolution shown in the mix of the book here. Where it's like yeah, the Watcher. I mean, I think that one's going to require some explanation from the general audience, but I don't know. I, I appreciate it. I don't know about the general audience. The only time I felt it was like a pop culture reference may be too far, but again, it's like it's like one in the grand hole. I don't. I won't sweat over. Yeah, it. yeah, right. Like, here's another one. I mean, it's the, there, there's nothing like the uh, the infamous Ready Player One paragraph where it's like, oh, I had the freaking Millennium Falcon and blah 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 blah, and you know, nothing like that at all. So, it kept saying, all right, uh, this you. Is, that this is the, this is a good moral debate here. Uh, there's been a debate that there's too many voices that sound like mine and are too analytical. That was absolutely the hardest part of writing the project. I hate writing in the first person. Oh, Cap, I, I know all about that. Um, and I did 31 POVs. Yeah, Cap, honestly, I admire the challenge of that. I do. Um, now, having said that, you know, there certainly are characters where... Um, you know, some of them feel more like you than others do, certainly. And I do think that, you know, maybe one of the things is there, you know, there is maybe a little bit too too much of an analytical perspective from some of these characters, especially I would say some of the younger characters where, you know, I'm not necessarily sure like the kids or the teenagers would have this deep of a, of a thought process yet. Uh, but with that being said, I think... I think, uh, I'm sorry, I got sidetracked here. With that being said, I think that you really did do a decent job with just, you know, just coming up with a right, uh, with a right mix, you know, and honestly, Dragon, as we've already discussed with the superhero rewind of it all and stuff, it's, you know, uh, being analytical is kind of James Logan's calling card. You know what I mean? It's like, I love it, oh my goodness. I mean, it's half the reason you Yeah, love yeah. So it's not like that's a problem, you know? Uh, and like I said, I totally acknowledge like the challenge of writing so many different point of views. Um, I don't think you stuck to landing a hundred percent of the time, but I do think you stuck to landing a solid 80% of the I mean, time. I, with, I mean, up with different voices. And I'm going to say is I think you summed up really well there with the, with the 80% because I feel I, I, I've heard the complaint, but I feel the complaint is more minimal, but it's, it's, it's present though. Where again, the analytical thing is, is there, but it's not for like every, it's not for like a third of the care it's only for like, like less than a handful. Like it's like maybe three to five at the most uh -huh. that's happened. So it's like barely to, it's, it's only there a couple times. And usually like with not even like the main character of the story, it's like, you know, like even like, even like one of the favorites, like the Frank chapter, for example, and Frank, and again, this is, some of these have a buy where, okay, I can buy this character. Frank's had a full life, 35 years. He's kind of, he's kind of quoting, I, was he quoting Shakespeare? He was quoting like he studied something in, in, in college and he was studying. I think it was Shakespeare, yeah. Like a prophetic quote of some kind. And it was like, yeah, I mean, I don't know if Frank would do that in the moment based on kind of the kind of folks in this, this character. But then again, 35 years, what do I know? I mean, if any base I think of any of the characters who were citing that I believe it coming from him, then I do kind of the 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 former track star. You know, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But again, so it's, it's minimal. It's there, but it's you know, it's it's minimal. I don't think as much as people are kind of talking up to be. But it you know, it, it, it is there. Live and learn. Also, Kat points out you might also be interested to know I grew up and went to college in Lawrence, which again I, I mentioned this a little bit on the uh, the uh, one of the earlier live sh uh, live shows here. I was clarifying that Lawrence was basically that, that was the uh, the uh, uh, the uh, Shelley Grape House chapter. Yeah, one was she the fruit roll up lady. Basically, she was afraid that her husband might have been one of the baghead guys. So anyway, so yeah, that the whole massacre of Lawrence, which again, I I do that, that was another thing I want to mention to you before we forget about it. With the Lawrence event, I like that if I'm not mistaken, we went a little bit out of order because we go pretty much forward all throughout the story, but we have a moment where we interject with the principal of the, of the school here, and he's kind of like commenting like, "Oh God, the you know, the Lawrence tragedy and everything." So we're building up Lawrence before we get there, building up kind of Lawrence in the fallout. 
and, and such there. So that's uh, that, that was kind of an interesting choice there. So that was uh, so again we went to Lawrence and he massacred in the novel. He killed he killed the crap out of Lawrence. <laughs> All right. Oh, uh, Dragon, really quick, the only reason I brought up Aqua Teen, the Aqua Teen movie specifically, is because there's a hilarious heavy metal parody of Let's All Go to the Lobby. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, during one of the segments, there, there's a, I, I think it's like a, like a soda, a soda cup or something is like, if I catch you pirating this movie, Satan will rain down. And, you know, just get, gets really in deep. Like it really breaks down at the pirating part of it. <laughs> Anyways. Yeah. Okay. That's one last thing for us here. And we'll, I think we'll double back yep. to the uh, Jack, uh, Jack be nimble here. Us to make sure we cover that base there. Um, last thing. How did you feel about the Alaskan uh, secession? I thought it was really clever. I definitely like the idea. You know what's actually kind of tragic about it is that it, it, it's like a would be uh, salvation, right? It's, and I feel like the novel, there are certain elements of the novel that have that kind of like tinge, tinge of, uh, you know, it, it would have been a solution if things would have just gone the other way. And I feel like the Alaska thing was a good solution, but of course, things just got way too muddied up way too quickly. So, yeah, I, I like I, I like that about the Alaska thing. It's kind of like a reverse kind of Vietnam as like the fifty first state sort of thing almost. It's kind of like a reverse, like we take away from the whole instead of add add, add one extra. Mm -hmm. there. It's kind of because uh, basically throughout the story, like Alaska was always kind of on the outside. I'm going to all, all the frozen people are going to Alaska. Essentially, we're all we're going to Alaska, which again we're kind of it's kind of on the fringes anyway. So it's like it's all the way out there, and again we're getting further away as as, as we can. So it did, you know, it made sense, yeah. Right. Okay. All right. So. Jack B. Nimble. Uh, the Frybox killer following himself and mailing himself was creative. Imagine a murder mystery series set in this world. Oh my goodness. Again, Cap, listen to this man. Solid idea. Murder <laughs> mystery series. Again, there's so many. Again, like we already we already kind of got a glimpse of like of, of a few kind of like kind of killers in a sense here with the Frybox killer with Dean. And technically, and again, uh, the potential interesting, you know, uh, sorry, with Roger. If, if, I, the character I really want to hear more about is this Roger Tippins fellow. He seems really interesting to me. It's the idea of this, the, the remorseful killer in the in in the, in the foodified world, just kind of looking for looking for redemption. That's a character that you could definitely like write a whole book about if you wanted to. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Uh, Tippins, uh, Tippins guy, and it's kind of can we again can we seek you know redemption for terrible actions and we've dedicated next Netflix shows to this of Bojack? Like, can we ever get redemption or absolution? <laughs> anyway. Right. Okay, so I guess uh, if I'm here, if I say final thoughts, and then we're gonna like a, get, get a comment here. By no, I, no, know, no. I know, I <laughs> know. Okay, I guess you. I you mean, start we're two off. hours deep into this. Um, You're right. We, okay, maybe you start off. We'll see if we have any comments, and we'll try to sandwich it again, appropriate given the food, the foodified nature of our discussion. Uh, the sandwich. Right. Why don't you start off, and I'll, 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 I'll close this. Yeah, final thoughts. I just think it's crazy that this was written like all the way back in 2017. You know, all like before uh, before the pandemic was even like a even like a glimmer in anyone's eye. You know, and even a remote possibility of any of the current day events happening. Because I really do think that, that is kind of the draw of it, for better or for worse, is that it mirrors real life in such a fascinating and in socio-political way, I just, I, I just think there's so many different elements of it that, uh, that just have fascinating implications. I think the novel has a great build to it, a great pace. Uh, the three acts are defined very well. And of course, everything kind of the shit hitting the fan. Once we get the borders open, all that is just worked in wonderfully. Um, I think, uh, it's a book filled with characters. And like I said, I think about, at least a good 80% of the characters really land and become really memorable in their own right. Um, but yeah, that's, that's about it. Right. Um, so yeah, we have, we have comments here. Should we read those? Then I close this out or should I, uh, we can go ahead, uh, do your final thoughts. Then we can close things out with the comments. Okay. That sounds, that sounds good. That sounds better. Than what it was. Yeah. Okay. All right. So final thoughts for me. Uh, you know, I, you know, I remember in, in pitching, uh, when, when, 
just by like you know the stars aligning, you know this uh, you know the, 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 this drops and I'm, I'm like oh boy I'm gonna I'm gonna make a meal out, I'm sorry more food puns I'm gonna make a meal out of this where I'm just gonna be able to, you know watch this and just gonna like you know, listen to this and I'm just gonna have a good time with it. I don't even know if Teak is gonna like it I'm gonna do this for me and I, I got into like a first couple chapters of like oh god I, I, I gotta Tiki's got to read this. I got to stay. Up. <laughs> I don't like, yeah, I just, we we, we got to do something on this, man. It's so good. I'm only into like the first like three chapters or so. And like, I'm at the Oscar Mayer where we got to talk about the sticky. Mm -hmm. <laughs> got to read this. And that's like, okay, I don't care. It's like, I don't, we got to figure out when the month to do. And of course, we just lucked out on the, like, when I was doing like the rereader, I was, I was at a certain point, like, oh God, the 26th. Perfect. Stars align. <laughs> right, right. You got to do it. So, my final thoughts are, you know, this story is, um, you know, again, I love how the story sprinkles. Uh, we have these sprinkles of, of of hope as the situation darkens all throughout it. You know, it was, it was like you know the transformation for man. It was transformation for mankind's betterment. And it, I, I I love how we, you know, we I guess in the by the end of the story, I lean towards you know like. There's a question of, you know, was this, this is the action of a mad scientist or is this like the mad scientist with a grudge, you know, kind of getting revenge for his wife or is this a guy genuinely meaning what he says and he wants to, he wants to kind of change the world for the better. And I kind of end up coming across at the end of the day, I feel he was making, he's trying to make a point, but a point that will never come across till the damage is done. And what does that say? Damage is damage at the end of the day. You know, it's like, it's like either Every diet has limits. It's it's basically it's either every diet has limits or we change or we die. We evolve or we die is the mentality. You know, it's like either it's like what what is he saying about this at the end of the day? Like you, know, you all everyone has to change their ways or else. And again, how much how is, is that inspiring natural change? That I like the flawed level of thinking within kind of the premise that gives us the, the entire book. Once we get to the explanation of how things are done, I think it's really. It's a really interesting way of, of kind of framing the event. Like, is this the actions of a madman? I mean, I kind of lean towards kind of the actions of a madman. Does he have a point? Do we learn something about ourselves through this experience, through the, through the foodification? Yes, we do. But again, it just seems, again, it, it, going with the story as naturally as it progresses, it takes us to a dark place. And that's kind of how humanity goes. Like, in the course of three years, things just get progressively worse. And what does that say about the world we're living in today? Where again, it's, it's sort of like the age old question, of, uh, you know, like if we had something like a bigger than life thing happen to us, would we respond as fantastically as we would, you know, as we would in a fictional setting, you know, like if Superman were real, would we, would we take to him? I like to think, yes. I mean, some people have, have the, have the, have the thought of no, like certain directors, like, no, we, we reject him as all get out. Where are you nuts? So at the end of the day, this is just this is such an utterly fascinating piece of fiction. It's next level fiction. Man. I don't use that lightly. It is, it, this is next level fiction. This is the kind of stuff we need to write. This is the kind of stuff where right now we're all crawling up the walls. This is the stuff we need to listen to. This is the stuff we, we need to explore. This is the stuff raising the right questions and pressing into them. You know, like we're just kind of evaluating ourselves. I don't know if I don't know if the author is necessarily saying something kind of like negative about humanity with this. I don't think he is, given that we can't we vaguely kind of know the guy. But again, you look at this piece, it, it it's very interesting. It's kind of framing there, there are a lot of harsh truths in this book, and it's it's still an out, up to perception. That's why the book kind of ends ambiguously with kind of the president's decision-making process there. Like, you know, what choice would you make? You know, like, do we just go with kind of, do we lay in apathy or do we just kind of go with, like, go for change, whether it be good or bad or uncertain? So it's a lot of interesting stuff. We raise all this stuff with next level fiction. I wouldn't have it any other way. I, you know, I just, this is utter just really good stuff is such, such a riveting read and again something we definitely needed while uh, while again like comic shops are not open right now guys like that last bit, great batman story it was curse of the white knight part two and this was like something really satiating kind of you know kind of filled filled the loss for me a little bit there i'm just like oh god i need something good to read man I need something you know good story i love a good story and we got a good story i'm very happy with it all right okay just to read off the last couple comments here captain logan says uh this is an absolutely fascinating wonderfully thoughtful discussion you guys are just excellent thank you cap thank you so much uh thank you so much for your comments lots of things i never thought about and he says uh, uh and i'm not just saying that because you said nice things i really appreciated your criticisms and i'm so glad you discussed the problem with the book yeah cap i gotta tell you that was the main thing that kind of intimidated me about this podcast was i didn't wanna, i was very conscious of the fact that I didn't want to come in here and just like say like, Oh my God, it's amazing. 10 out of 10, no, no flaws at all. You know, cause it as a writer myself, oh God, <laughs> little red letter media reference cap. I know you're a red letter media <laughs> fan. We dragon and I can't get enough of that quote from the, 
from the uh, Rogue One video. It broke new ground. I'm my logical father in the whole. <laughs> oh God. Anyways, um, but uh, just to just to kind of relate something, I was talking about that little seven chapter novella thing that I wrote the other day, and over the course of a week, and it's fine. I don't think it's my best work by any means. But um, you know, I've shown I, I've shown it to a couple family members and Cap. I gotta tell you, I'm sure you can relate to this. There's nothing more frustrating than a family member just falling over themselves, like, "Oh my god, it's so perfect! You're a genius! Oh god, ten out of ten! Oh, oh well, my god, you, my oh, I've got you're so smart! I'm like, how yeah, will be right? Good. Right, right. I mean, yeah, it's good, but like, you know, just telling me that I'm a genius. I mean, I know I'm not a genius. You know, it's it's not. It's not constructive. It's not constructive, you know. So, Cap, that's that's all I wanted to be in this conversation is constructive. So, I very much appreciate that you felt that I was. Good to hear. All right, uh, Jack B. Nimble says, "Great discussion. Looking forward to checking your guys' channel out." And this is where I get into my uh, self promotion territory, folks. <laughs> Uh, so, guys, if you enjoyed this conversation, our channel. I feel like our channel and Geek Solutions channel. There's a lot of cross pollination here because we cover stuff that Geek Volution doesn't cover. Geek Volution covers stuff that we don't cover. Um, it's mostly focused on Disney because, of course, uh, so you want to be an Imagineer, very Disney heavy channel. But we cover a lot of other things as well. We cover a lot of animation. We just did uh, we just did recaps of every episode of Better Call Saul. Uh, lots of stuff, lots of stuff. Uh, just generally speaking, we are mostly just uh, podcasts live streams, podcasts, that kind of dealio. So uh, a lot of the stuff that Cap does on a week-to-week -week basis, we also kind of do a similar format with our discussions. So check us out, you know, if you, if you want to see more. We've got DuckTales recaps. We've got, like I said, Better Call Saul, a lot of general uh, geek culture stuff. We do a monthly movie memoir show where we talk about each movie we saw every month. Of course, that's a little bit weird now, given the current state of things, but we're going to try it. In April, we'll see how it goes. Uh, we've got some game shows. We got a Disney debate show that's essentially like movie fights, but with all Disney questions. Yeah, we, always, we, so, yeah. we go really in depth with our recaps too. So, like, literally, if you're afraid something's yeah, not going to yeah, be covered absolutely. in a recap, do not, folks. We're the guys for you because we literally cover every detail. When we do like the animated back cave. We're basically at the cell of that. Is like Tiki is watching. Oh, yeah, the, you should probably tell them about the animated back so, cave. Yeah, by all means. Folks, we do a show called Animated Back Cave, where essentially the premise is we're going through the Batman the animated series where I have seen everything, but Tiki is watching it for the first time. And again, we just kind of recap it from point A to point B, go through all the stuff. Uh, it's basically, imagine like the slowest commentary you've ever watched, or again, scintillating discussion. You'd be the judge. Uh, the point being, it's uh, it's uh, you know, it's, it's it's quite fun. Just get kind of his fresh reactions, and I give him the context, like the behind the scenes and the. Stuff like that, and of course, like, you know, like shows that we like. If you want to dig deeper into like the stuff, there's like the, we we were huge fans of Bates Motel, and we covered pretty much we've covered the Netflix shows. Uh, you know, we're we're gonna try to kind of catch up before some of the new Disney Plus shows kind of happen. But like we, for example, like, we Marvel covered all Netflix the shows. Marvel Netflix shows. Like for example, we covered all the Daredevil <laughs> stuff, uh, Luke Cage, uh, Jessica Jones. Uh, well, again, soon gotta cover season three, of Jessica. The point being, like. Look, look, Daredevil, Bates Motel, we have, we have Agent Carter, for example. We've, we've covered all those uh, in Galavant. the we make sense of recaps. Gallivant. Um, and uh, and uh, so so on and so forth. Again, really proud of the, a Better Call Saul, though. Judging Saul, we like to call it. Uh -huh. uh, so like, a, lot of, a lot of fun there. So point being, uh, we, we got gobs of stuff. We also, like, when stuff comes back, we Rick and Morty, and you know, we kind of like a little more loosey-goosey in discussion there. But, you know, we have some... We have we have some good stuff. I don't want to say we're the sure. best ever because we're not, but we're we're we're, just, we're humble guys no, like we're, talking about. We're clearly, a, we're kind of like we've always existed in the shadow of Geek Evolution, but you know. <laughs> Again, folks, you're looking for quality. Go to Geek Evolution. If you're looking for guys who care yeah. about stuff and like talking about stuff, that's us. We're the guys. Yeah, Cap, very much in agreement. Uh, Cap, I wish I had people to show it to. I, I do. I wish I had people to bounce my ideas off of. But right now, it's kind of slim pickings there. Um, I actually do have a forum that I can bounce my creative I writing ideas off of. So that's helpful. I, I, I've gotten way more helpful feedback from that. Um, honestly, I just said, you know, my, my grandma kind of like knows that I'm working on writing. So she kind of insists on reading it. And it's honestly just super cringe because I know that she's not even really going to get the deeper subtext of what I'm trying to write about. And yet she's going to call me a genius for it anyways. So, you know, <laughs> that's what I'm dealing with. 
Anyways, Dragon, any other, uh, after that extended commercial, any other <laughs> thoughts? Uh, well, again, folks, uh, it was, it has been uh, kind of a very, it's been a pleasure to, uh, you know, talk about, uh, well, we, we never really talk about kind of our, our love for, uh, you know, geek pollution. And, uh, it's, you know, it's kind of nice to reflect on that. And again, this book is just, it was, it, it's kind of like the fun thing that brought us to this point. And it was, uh, Really fun to discuss. Really fun. To, I just love the kind of the hype that the, the, you know, we, that, uh, the attention the book's been getting, and seeing in the comments. And I got laid out all the all the the uh, little uh, checkpoints for people because I knew like, oh god, this book's so great, but it's so extensive, and people are going to lose their places. And I wanted like to be able to follow along. And you know, ideally, if we were to talk about perhaps, I don't know, they want to watch the thing beforehand. Maybe they they will find it. So it's uh, been a lot of fun. I'm just so happy to see some of my old my old live stream buddies here, and uh, it's. Um, it's a uh, it, it's quite great. You know, in bag studios, T uh, you know the uh, T Edge one uh, Jack uh, uh, Jack B Nimble. I'm sorry, I keep saying I want to see like Jack Benable, but it's Jack B Nimble. I know that's what I keep reading too. Yeah, <laughs> uh, Madman, uh, the Apostolic Nerd. I mean, just the whole. I mean, guys, uh, you're you're the best. Again, I hope to see you on some live streams uh, in the future. Of course, uh, the band provides the live streams. Geek Collusion, Captain Logan, whole bunch. I mean, Cap. I mean, like, again, not not just for like the sake of like you know talking all positive and stuff about uh, about the novel. Because again, we we had our faults. Again, we already kind of covered all this stuff already. As as you said, as Tiki said, I wanted to tread over that again. Just you know, again, it, how could we not talk about this just for the quality of, but also, man, for all the good that Geek Pollution has done, man, for all the stuff they've talked about for for our benefit. How could we not talk about something they did just just you know, for ourselves? Something that was a quality, and something that was a like true grit, true like you know, like you know, like spit and polish one of this thing and it turned out really nice all right well thank you guys so much for uh for engaging in this conversation with us i i you know i was genuinely curious to see how much attention this will get how many people actually you know would take the time to read it and then transfer over from geek Evolution to our channel but uh, i love the response we got i love the comments uh very humbling to have captain logan in the comments here and to say that he enjoyed the conversation and thought it was a very nuanced conversation. That's uh dragon. You know what? I got to tell you, that's not quite Kevin Smith's thing. You have an awesome podcast, but it's, it's pretty close. It's pretty close as far as I'm concerned for the amount of time that I've been following cap. So hey, good enough I gotta for say, me. Probably, good enough. Yeah. <laughs> should probably had our had, uh, had ourselves on the back for this one. I think we did good here. I think we did good. You guys are you guys are amazing. It's been a great conversation. You guys are more than welcome to stop by for any of our other live streams or uh, you know comments and uh, whatnot. You guys, uh, you know, it's, it's fantastic. We're eager to hear from you. Hopefully, in the future, hopefully, you like some of the stuff we kind of hyped out for you. I don't know. We'll see. Take care. All right, Dragon. I think there's only one more thing left to do, Dragon. You know what it is? <laughs> what is it? <laughs> Go to the lobby. Let's, let's all, all go, go to the lobby. lobby. Let's all go, go to, to the, the lobby. lobby. Because cheese. <laughs>